we're going to call the meeting to order at 6.30 on September 9th, 2019. Our first order of business is to ask two gentlemen to come forward, Doug Slaughter and Craftsman Steve Locke. Hey everybody, Please sit. Steve Locke. And, um, Wanna yeah. sit down and okay. sit down, press the button, make sure the green light's on, thank you. Yeah. It is. All right. We so, my audio. name is Steve Locke, and um, I've been doing woodworking for about 25 years, and I'm um, a friend of Dave Zomack. And when he told me that they had to take down the maple on the top of Mount Pollux, I told him, why don't you set a little wood aside for me, and let me see if I can maybe make something out of it. So, I, he gave me a couple of logs, maybe this by this around. I sawed them up into boards, put them out in the backyard, and forgot about them for a year or so, and when I went back to look at them, I found that some of the wood had acquired this beautiful fungus that leads to a condition known as spalting in maple, which is why this has such nice character. I mean, you think of maple, you think of a very blonde wood, but when it gets this spalting in it, it gets this lovely colorations and, well, it just looks very, very nice. So I decided I wanted to use that for the head of this and then a nice clear grain uh, for the handle of it to contrast. And I made this sounding block because I looked up online and that's what you do. You don't bang on the table. It's very crude, you bang on the, on the sounding block. So anyway, um, I was very happy with how it came out. Uh, Dave told me he liked it very much. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored to present this to the town for their use going forward. Thank you, Steve. So I'll, I'm gonna share a few remarks uh, about Mount Pollux and that, uh, that Dave uh, Zomek shared with me and, and just to give uh, the viewing audience as well as the counselors a little bit of background. Um, if you haven't been, Mount Pollux is one of the most popular and well-loved conservation areas in Amherst. It's just off of Southeast Street. Um, I've personally gone and watched sunsets there. It's a very, very, very beautiful place. Uh, thousands of people visit Mount Pollux each year to picnic, read, paint, bird watch, and take in the beautiful views of the Mount Holyoke Range and almost 360 degree uh, views of the valley. Many weddings and other celebrations take place there each year. Uh, it was purchased in 1984 from the Atkins family. The area was once an active apple orchard. I think you may even still see a few apple trees kind of going wild out there. Um, for many years, there were two stately sugar maples guarding the summit. Unfortunately, lightning strikes and disease took their toll on one of the trees, and for public safety reasons, it had to be taken down in 2018, which is when Steve got involved with his, uh, his pieces of wood. Uh, there have been new trees planted in, in place to replace those old ones, so at some point in our, in our future, we'll have stately maples again on, on the top of Mount Pollux. But it's my pleasure tonight with, with Steve to, to present this, this gavel to you at the uh, transition uh, event that we had. I made a, uh, uh, a promise that I get a key, which is that we would present the gavel to you this evening for use at the council meetings. And hopefully it will uh, keep us in good stead in years to come to have uh, that uh, piece of our history um, guiding us through the work that you guys do. So uh, we appreciate the work that you do. And I appreciate the honor to come and help present this gavel to to, uh, to the council as a whole, and, and particularly Ms. Grismira as the president. So thank okay. you all very much. Thank so you. You're welcome. Take that up and give it to you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. You should shut the mic. Yes, it does have a maple leaf signifying the tree it came from. Um, thank you. Um, that's another example of Amherst having taken an opportunity to buy open land when it became available, preserving our outdoors. Um, so uh, the next item on our agenda is a hearing, and actually the petitioner, Eversource, has withdrawn their request. Therefore, I move to close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So, 13, four, none against and no abstentions. All right. Um, we are now prepared for general public comment. We will take public comment on any matter that you would like to speak to other than those on the agenda that we have identified. And those are in fact 7A, 7C, and 7D. Public comment on those agenda items will occur at the time we have the discussion during the meeting. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. And we ask that you um, come up, you raise your hand, you be recognized, you come forward, <coughs> excuse me, you sit at the desk, make sure the mic is on, and ident identify your name and where you live. So are there people here who would like to make general public comment? Please come forward. I'm Felicia Mednick. Okay. Anything else I've just, just my name? You live in Amherst? Yeah. Thank you. And um, I would like to comment because I heard there's a pot that we need a new bus in town and um, that electric buses are very expensive. And so there's thought of maybe getting a diesel bus. And I would like to speak, I'm part of Mothers Out Front and I'm here representing a few of my fellow mothers, who would like to um, encourage the town to um, not get a di another diesel bus. And I, on my own, have started looking on the internet and um, seeing that over time, you, we end up saving money with an electric bus, although the initial outlay is greater, and that's a problem. From what I've seen, some towns are raising another municipal bond and, or having a specific t tax for that, which may or may not work. What I also noticed is that just as early as last year, there was lots of money from a Volkswagen settlement and from other incentive programs that paid for buses or for most of them in Martha's Vineyard and a few other places in Massachusetts. There was a $75 million settlement here. So I would... <clears throat> respectfully ask if and when this comes up to um, give it to the whatever the Climate Action Committee is called, that committee, and for them to do the research to see if it is feasible for the town and how it could be feasible for the town. Because I think over time, we don't know what's gonna happen with gas and how that price might fluctuate, but it might get even a, even a bigger savings and also be a saving for our environment. And we do have the 100% renewable goal in our town. So I don't think it makes sense to get a diesel bus now. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your comment. We will be taking that up later, but it was not identified as an item for public comment. So I appreciate your coming forward. Others for public comment. Vince? Excuse me, Vince. If you'd like to give any handouts, you hand them to the town clerk. I mean, the clerk of the council. Thank you. Thank you. If I can wait while the clerk is circulating. Um. So my name is Vincent O'Connor. I live at uh, Summer Street in Amherst. And um, in June, I, I uh, came before the council and made a suggestion that uh, the council establish a commission, a refugee and, and asylum applicant uh, resettlement commission. The chair of the, of the uh, council uh, said they were awaiting uh, a written uh, proposal. Um, this is the proposal um, on the front page. Um, 
There's a series of whereases uh, that, and the, the, the proposal that I put in writing for the council's consideration, and hopefully somebody will move it and have it sent to committee, um, is that the 15 member, 15 member commission, that um, there be no staffing, that the only cost to the, uh, to the city would be um, a one postcard inviting people to volunteer housing and uh, that, the, that the goals of the commission would be to identify housing that would be made available gratis. Um, there's a, a, a numerical goal that I've cited that I think is reasonable and doable within the town. Um, I've proposed that the, those who volunteer housing uh, be uh, not identified. I've, I've left open the MGL uh, reference because I think that would be the business of the city attorney to identify what privacy provision would would be appropriate given the nature of the commission and what it's doing um, and make I, I do make the point that um, in the in the preface in the whereas prefaces that affordable housing the existing affordable housing uh, stock is not available to house refugees and asylum immigrants uh, applicants because uh, most of that of housing is available only to citizens or to green card holders. And so there really is a need for an uh, organization of the municipality to solicit gratis um, offers. Um, and and that all, so that the, those who volunteer housing, uh, both commercial housing and, and private accommodations within people's homes, uh, unused mother-in-law apartments, things like that, uh, be kept out of the public realm. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I would really encourage the, the council to someone on the council to make a motion to refer this to the appropriate committee so that um, the work of, of such a commission could begin and be concluded, I think, uh, quickly. Uh, my goal, as stated here, would be to get a, a report on how much housing the commission has determined to be available by December 1st, and that the report be um, minimal in terms of how many people volunteer housing, how many people were interviewed, and how much housing has been identified. Um, leaving out all references to individuals and so forth. As I think you might understand is appropriate given the, the sort of controversial nature of this and the potential of those who, who have very strong feelings about immigrants and re asylum refugees uh, their tendency to uh, uh, make threats of violence and so forth. So um, I think that's, that's all I have to say. You have, you have the proposal in writing that was requested by, by the chair. Um, I'm, I'm in the phone book. If any member of the, of the council uh, desires to speak with me outside of the committee process, I'd be happy to talk with them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there additional public comment? Sir, please come forward. I'm Jeff Lee from District 5, uh, live in Amherst. Um, and I'm delighted to hear that the uh, hearing uh, is dismissed tonight. Uh, regarding the transformer on the South Common. Um, appreciate whatever discussions led to that. Uh, I was wondering, I did some research, I was prepared to speak on it, and I was wondering if I could just share what I, I learned. To Certainly. Okay. I'd like to voice my concern about the request from Eversource to locate a six foot by five foot by three foot transformer on the town's South Common near the intersection of South Pleasant Street and Spring Street. To offer some historical perspective, in 1875, Frederick Law Olmsted, America's preeminent landscape architect and designer of Central Park, 
was invited by Austin Dickinson to advise on improvements to the town common. One of his proposals was that the telegraph wires and hay scales on the common should be removed, and within three years, his suggestion was implemented. Since then, maintaining the beauty of the common and surrounding area has, for the most part, been a, a town priority. I'm told that Amherst's first town manager, Alan Torrey, went to great lengths to require that utility equipment in the downtown be placed underground. Since his time, we have slid back a little. In 2014, regrettably, town meeting put up little resistance when Western Mass Electric asked to relocate an underground transformer in front of Douglas Funeral Home to a less than attractive pad-mounted four foot by four foot by two foot green box, <coughs> green box just off North Pleasant Street on uh, the Boltwood Alley walkway. I see that there are now two large electric boxes there. Many communities take the undergrounding of utility equipment quite seriously. Charlton and Lemonster have zoning bylaws that require underground utilities in their business enterprise and downtown overlay districts. Sutton requires underground utility connections in all condominium complexes with more than 25 units. And in 2015, Northampton made the relocation of overhead utility wires to the underground, a vital part of its project to renovate Pulaski Park, which is their equivalent of our town common. While it carries some cost to Eversource to main transform maintain transformers underground, they have already invested in a vault beneath South Pleasant Street, which could continue to house power distribution hardware. And where can it be more important to eliminate the clutter of utility equipment than on our historic and much used town common? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Additional comments, sir? Yes. Good evening, I'm David Mullins, uh, Tbury Lane. Um, I'm uh, here representing Amherst Leisure Services Community Theater. Thank you for providing the time to speak to you directly. I would like to take this moment to call your attention to the letter I sent to the town council dated August 27th on behalf of Amherst Leisure Services Community Theater. In that letter, I described our needs and the situation we find ourselves in with regard to the proposed demolition of the existing DPW facility, <clears throat> uh, which we have used as a set shop for the past 12 years. Where will we build our sets is a real concern for us. We have been a valuable and successful program of LSSE for 27 years now, and as the town moves forward with its plans to build a new DPW facility, we hope that you will keep the very real needs of ALSCT in mind and work with us to ensure that our needs are met during this transition and into the future. I have spoken with Paul Bachman, Guilford Mooring, and Barbara Bills about our concerns and our proposal and would welcome the opportunity to speak with any of you or other town officials in an effort to explore all options and ensure that our needs receive full consideration. I look forward to working with you to explore what the next steps might be. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Additional comments? Please come forward. Hi there. Good evening. Julian Hines, District 4, and I am commenting on the proposed accessible drop-off area in the right of way on 26 Spring Street. I'm sorry, but that is an agenda item that we're going to reintroduce under 7A, and at that time we will have public comment. My apologies. Certainly. Are there any other public comments at this time? Okay. Then we're going to move on to proclamations, and I would like to ask Marta Guevara, is that, did I get it right, who is the Amherst Regional Public Schools Director of Student and Family Engagement. And Good evening, everybody. Um, I come to you, um, I've, well, I live in Amherst and have been here since 1974. So my family and I moved here from Puerto Rico, my parents to pursue uh, their doctoral degrees. And we were going to be here two years and this, have been here ever since. So we've made this our home and just very proud to be residents of Amherst. I come to you with a request um, to have, to change the day that we've historically had 
um, and that we've had a proclamation for many years uh, to highlight the Puerto Rican Heritage Day instead of November 19th, which um, was what many, like a decade ago, um, we would celebrate the arrival of Columbus to the <laughs> island of Puerto Rico. Um, our committee, which is comprised of students, staff, and families, uh, we wanted to highlight um, a rebellion that happened in, um, in Lares, Puerto Rico, in the center of the island on September 23rd, 1868, which was a, a rebellion, at just a cry against colonization, at that time the Spaniards. And so that, um, that happens on September 23rd, and we wanted to just highlight that rather than the actual colonization of the island. Um, so we look um, to, we did this last year, which we brought together mm -hmm. quite quickly, but it was a lovely event in which um, some of you were there, but we had student voices and we had um, a lot of speakers. And so we wanna highlight and strengthen that activity and do it again in the front steps of the town hall. We will have dancing and spoken word and other things. And what we hope to do is to highlight um, Latino Heritage Month next year. So, you know, that goes from the middle of September to the middle of November. So we're starting slow <laughs> and we're going, you know, we'd like to just highlight and just extend on what we did last year. Okay, thank you. As we now do with all proclamations, uh, this was referred automatically to the um, Governance, Organization, and Legislation Committee. Mm -hmm. There were some changes made to it. I think they were generally modest, but Mandy Jo, would you please speak to the review? I will. Um, we made a couple of Scrivener stuff, and I'm not gonna adjust, uh, to address that, but we did two things to the last two paragraphs on the um, proclamation. The first was to pretty much add the um, raising of the flag and mm -hmm. the dates of the raising of the flag into yep. the proclamation. While GOL has not gotten to creating a policy yet on flag raisings um, <laughs> on the UN poll, um, we have briefly discussed it in passing and this is one of our thoughts is to include any desire to have a flag raised into the proclamation that is being asked of the council to pass. So that's why we added that um, language. And then um, for consistency sake, we decided to go with, there, there's two ways to um, sign the proclamation <laughs> and we went with the one we liked better for consistency <laughs> sake. So that's, that's why that sentence was crossed out and a new sentence was added at the very end. Um, those were the two changes with those changes that we recommend, GOL voted 3-0 with two counselors absent to declare that it would be clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. Um, oh, and the dates we put in for the flag raising were September 23rd to September 30th, which is a full yeah. week, That's which cool. conforms with the full week that the Tibet, Tibetan Day proclamation was granted to. That's great. Okay. So there is a proclamation in your packet, and uh, the council I'm sorry, needs to find my motions. And we need a motion, uh, and that is to adopt the proclamation in celebration of Puerto Rican Heritage Month as presented. Is there such a motion? Pat's moved and second. Uh, Dorothy seconded. <laughs> so various others more than willing to. Are there any other questions? The only question I have is what time will your celebration be? So it'll be 12.30 to 1.30. On the 23rd? Yes, and we hope to be in front of the town hall. If, uh, if it's raining, we've secured the space, just in case. Okay. As many of us as can be there, we'll be there. Thank and you. And join you for that event. Thank so you it's so 12 much. So it's 12.30 to 1.30 yes. on September 23rd. And we have a flyer, and, and we've followed, we've shared it, and it's on our website, and I think in the town as well. So great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. All of those in favor, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Us abstain? No. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have yeah. a good night. Certainly. Okay. The next item. Next item on our G. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, Alyssa. 
So when we looked at motions, we did break out a second motion for the actual flag raising to make it clear because even though the proclamation is very clear on the flag raising, most proclamations don't involve flag raisings and so to expect that town staff will automatically scour through a proclamation to find out if there's a flag raising is asking a little much in my direct experience. Therefore, there was just going to be a separate motion that also directed that the flag be raised because then that way the town manager could just send that off to the staff that needed Thank to know you. that because we appreciate that they do that on our behalf. So there is a second motion and is that the town hoist and fly the Puerto Rican flag from September 23rd, 2019 through September 30th, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. Andy, second. second. Mandy Jo. Alyssa. I just prefer, since I didn't write this, that we remove hoist. <laughs> we, Sorry, we Raise. don't do that. We just fly flags. We, we, we fly flags. It doesn't matter raising, just okay. fly the flag. That's a friendly amendment. Yes. So that the town fly the Puerto Rican flag. Are there any further comments or questions? All right, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstain. The vote's 13 to nothing uh, in favor. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a presentation tonight. This is a presentation that is about the Centennial Water Treatment Facility. This presentation was made at the Finance Committee uh, meeting just this last Thursday, I guess. Uh, but the reason we're doing it now is because it will be part of, uh, this will be one of the two items that we are doing a public forum on on the 23rd, and we will not be repeating the presentation at that time, but just briefly summarizing it. So, Mr. Boring. Good evening. It's kind of a flashback, sorry. Um, so, one quick question. How do I change it? I've never done this this way. Okay. So, what we talked about for the Finance Committee, it was some people had some questions, counselors and some public members had questions about Centennial Water Treatment Plant and why we've chosen to proceed and keep pushing forward to upgrade it and replace it. Um, this is the slideshow that was done by Tata and Howard after they finished their 2017 study of water uh, supply study for the town of Amherst. This was presented to the select board on October 16th in 2017 and I've updated it. There's now three new slides. Finance Committee only had two slides. You guys get an extra one. I will try to go quickly and um, then you can ask questions. So the, this is the goals of the study. Um, this study came about after the drought in 2016 in which many people were questioning whether we actually had enough water to do anything and to make it through another drought like this. The study found that we did, but the study also found that we needed to work on building our resources and improving our system. Um, next slide. So just, this is one of the slides I added. So just so you know, we have different types of permits from DEP. We have, under the Water Management Act, we have a withdrawal permit. This is how much water the town can use on a daily basis. This is the average per day for a year. Um, the town DEP feel, says we should use a total of 4.55. That's the most we should use per day. It's broken down into two pieces, a registration, which is an older piece of legislation which granted communities an amount of water, and some registrations actually granted communities ownership of uh, water bodies and water resources that were on other people's land. It's kind of a neat thing. It's an old piece of legislation. Um, our registration granted us 3.34 MGD. We then got a permit, and our permit actually grants us another 1.2 MGD, and that gives us the total of 4.5. So that's what we're allowed to withdraw daily as our average withdrawal. If we go over that over the year, and we consistently are over it, then we have to answer the DEP. And that's a use issue, not a taken out of the ground issue really, it's a we're using too much water in the system is what they're saying. Next slide. So then every one of our sources has a limit on what can be withdrawn at the source. And that's the second part of our, of our world. 
So this is from, from the slide from the consultant, and this shows our groundwater supplies and our surface water supplies. So out of all of our groundwater supplies, even though you add up the groundwater supplies, if you add up the withdrawals, it's like seven, seven million gallons. We're only allowed to take 4.4 out per day from the groundwater sources. That's well one, two, three, four, five. Well six is up there, but well six is not connected to the system. It's not been developed into an operating well because it has an iron and manganese problem and would require us to upgrade baby carriage and do some serious piping to get it from six, well six to baby carriage to actually treat it. Surface water supplies, we have Atkins, which is allowed to, take, to treat and release 1.5 MGD, million gallons a day. The Pelham Reservoirs, which is where the Centennial Water Treatment Plant treats that water, is 1.5 million gallons a day. Next. So this is a map of the watershed area. Uh, everybody at home, I'm point, uh, trying to point. How much is coming out? So. This is the map of Amherst and the watershed sub-basins in Amherst. <clears throat> At the very bottom left corner, that's the, where the wells are. It's called the Lawrence Swamp. That's one sub-watershed. That color indication there means that it is in a critical a water, a groundwater withdrawal category four. Actually, it was five last time. It's actually four. Um, actually, sorry, I know it is five. So it's a groundwater category five. That's the worst of the categories that DEP has actually rated the watershed uh, sub-basins. So it means we're taking a lot of water out of the ground there. It also means that there's a lot of impervious and a lot of runoff in the area, a lot of development, which there kind of is and there kind of isn't. It's kind of one of those weird things with DEP, how they rated this. We're not the only people in this sub-watershed. There's also the Belcher Town. They have their Daigle well in this watershed. And then there's a, bunch, uh, a couple private wells that are large um, public water systems. They're, my, they're large private water systems that just serve little communities. Um, they're also in this area. Then you have the Pelham Reservoirs in the, kind of in the middle on the right of the map, right there. That's where Pelham is. And it's in its own little sub-watershed. And then you have Atkins above Pelham. It's in its own little sub-watershed. So as we talk about sub-watersheds, our new permit is going to talk about how you impact a watershed. In, in the world of DEP, they would like every sub-watershed to be a one. If you look, the Pelham Reservoir is a one. There's very little development, very little um, impervious, soil, impervious area. And <clears throat> because they didn't include surface water supplies in their water, uh, in their uh, sustainable water management initiative, it's, it's rated a one. Groundwater supplies, they are all part of the sustainable water management initiative, which is what guides our uh, permit. Um, if you look that up on the DEP website, I can tell you more about it. It's an interesting way to balance the needs of the environment, the fish, the aquatic animals, other aquatic animals, and the plants with the needs of the humans to drink, have water to drink. That's what they're trying to do is balance it out. And they want every place to be a one, really. But every place is not a one. We, don't, we haven't been a one for a long time. So in our new permit, we're going to be required to mitigate and minimize. If you read the Tate and Howard study, they kind of talked a little bit about mitigation and minimization. It means adjusting how you operate your system, taking water from one, one bowl and letting another bowl, which is in a critical condition, rest and relax and recharge the environment around it. <clears throat> Most of our watersheds in the state actually have their biggest use periods during August and September, July, August, September. We don't. Our biggest use periods are September, October, and April. I don't know why April, but April is a big one. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because things start warming up and people are outside doing more. Um, they use more water, but April is a big one. We're a little different. So this whole groundwater, groundwater, groundwater withdrawal category is based on April or August consumptions. So we're actually a little bit better because in August we don't consume as much, 
but we're still going to have to have some type of minimization in our system by taking water out of one bowl. And the biggest bowl we're taking groundwater out of is down at the Lawrence Swamp, where we have all our wells. We have no wells in Pelham and in Atkins. So if we actually take more water out of Pelham and Atkins during the times we have to rest the other ones, we're in a better shape. And that's also why one of the options we looked at was developing a well in the northwest side of town. So there's other sub-basins over there. There's other people in those sub-basins. Sunderland's in one. U.S. Fish and Wildlife is in one. Is in the same one. Uh, uh, Mass Fisheries has a well in one of them. And there's some private wells. The wells for some of the apartments in Sunderland are in these sub-watersheds. Hadley's in a, in a sub-watershed, which is the yellow one. That's where they have the Mount Warner wells near Lake Warner. They have their Callahan wells in the kind of the number four, kind of the pinkish one in the bottom left corner of the map. That's where they have their Callahan wells, which are their primary operating wells. So they're withdrawing directly below where we're withdrawing. So as we withdraw, they withdraw, Belchertown withdraws, those things are all looked at by DEP to kind of balance out. So this is just kind of how the, the DEP is looking at how people withdraw their water and how they affect the environment. Next, please. So again, we don't always use 100% well water. This was the average for 2015. We're allowed to take 4.4 out. We averaged around 1.6. So we're making up with water from Atkins and Pelham during that time period and balancing our system out. Next slide. So this is just a summary of our, our system. We have the Atkins Water Treatment Plant, Centennial Water Treatment Plant. Those are both surface water treatments. We have Baby Carriage Water Treatment Plant, which is in the south end of town. And that's an iron and manganese treatment facility. Well 4 and Well 6 both have high concentrations of iron and manganese. When Well 4 was developed, this treatment plant was built to remove the iron and manganese. And it, when it was, it was very clunky and cumbersome. We've kind of worked on that a bit. And then there's three tanks the town owns and one tank UMass owns, which is in the system to keep pressure up. So next. So the study looked at what kind of alternatives we had and then kind of looked at how we might adjust things. Next. These are the eight alternatives. Make baby carriage a better facility. As I told you, it's kind of clunky to operate. When it was built, it wasn't automated. It was a system that was only supposed to be run in August and September when the students came back to make up water so that we had enough water for the students. It was kind of a reaction to the 1980 send the students home issue that came up where UMass closed down and all the students went home. Upgrade Centennial Water Treatment Plant, replace well five, develop a well in Sunderland. We were calling it Sunderland at that time because we had two property owners in Sunderland who had properties they were willing to talk to us about. Connect Well 6, uh, connect Pelham Reservoir to the Atkins Water Treatment Plant, dredge Atkins, and connect to Mass Water Resources Authority, MWRA. MWRA owns the Quabbin. Next. So we've been working on the updating Well 4 for quite a while before this study started. As I said, it was a clunky system to operate. We had a bunch of chemicals we used to treat the iron and manganese and get it to precipitate out. We've gotten rid of almost all those chemicals, and we've gone to another way of operating the system which actually gets the iron out without the chemicals. Um, we also have uh, updated the well. The well had a motor on it, and you turn the motor on, and it ran full blast, and you turned the water off, the well off, and it stopped. So it was on and off and no in between. We have a variable frequency drive on the well now, which actually lets the pump run at different speeds and goes up and down as, ne as we need it to run up and down. Uh, and then what we've done is also, since before this report and during this report, we worked on um, putting backup power. They all have backup power to run the facilities now. And then we've been programming and planning to automate well four. We have a programmer who we contract with, and he's been writing the programming. 
And he's almost done with writing the programming and we'll be installing the mechanisms to make it an automatic facility. So you'll actually let it be able to run at night without having a staff member there to change things. And it'll send alarms out when things aren't running right. So that's where we're going with well four. That's moving along quite well and that's all within the budget we have that we, we budget every year for upgrades and maintenance on the facilities. The next alternative. <clears throat> the next alternative was upgrade Centennial. Centennial was built in about 81. It's never had anything done to it. We've been talking about doing something to Centennial since about uh, early 2005, 2006. Um, probably before that, actually. Uh, we came up with a plan, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, what that plan was in, in the next slides, but we had a plan and we were moving forward, but then we made some decisions to go a different route. Next slide. This is Well 5. Um, well 5 is in the su very southern end of the town. It butts up basically against the very roots of the mountains. Um, it's a very shallow aquifer. We don't have a lot of information about it. We are not as optimistic as our consultant is that you can make water, more water come out of that well than already comes out of that well. But this is Well 5. It's, a, it's kind of near Bay Road and uh, Holst Road. It's in that area. Next. Develop a well in Sunderland was another option. And then here you have the two property owners who were talking to us, Nielsen and uh, the, the Warner property. Um, it shows the areas, the red and the blue together show you what would flow into the Nielsen well. And the blue shows you what would flow into the Warner property well. Since we started this process, there's other options which have come up as well. So we've been kind of trying to develop our overall how we're going to approach this and how we're going to evaluate which property is the best property for us. It is moving. We're not at the point yet where we're going to do anything with it. The issue with this one and Well 5 are basically the same thing. If you want to try to make Well 5 produce more, if you want, or if you want to try to develop a brand new well, Someone else says yes, and someone else says no. It's not the town's only dis sole decision. We have to prove the DEP. We're not changing the groundwater characteristics, which we showed you, I showed you in the map, that we're not making the, water, the area worse for the aquatic animals and other things that need the water as well as the humans. So you may go in and buy a property and try to develop it for a half a million gallons or a million gallons a day, and DEP may come back and say, no, you can not do that. You ha can only get a quarter million gallons out, or you can only get a half, and you can only operate during these time periods. There's a lot of uh, speculation in how um, new sites and new wells will be permitted and how that will work out. So this is a little kind of, it's, it's not guaranteed how it, come, it works out, not at all. Next slide. These are the other uh, choices. Like we said, I said before, well six is high in iron or manganese. You'd have to pipe it to baby carriage. And if you wanted to run well four and well six at the same time, you actually have to make baby carriage bigger. You have to increase the capacity for baby carriage to treat water. Connecting Pelham to, to Atkins water treatment plant, it's a big pipe. You have to run a big pipe across a lot of private property, you get to the Atkins treatment plant. If you want to treat Atkins water and Pelham water at the same time, you have to expand the Atkins water treatment plant. It's not that easy. Dredge the Atkins reservoir. We could dredge the Atkins reservoir, but we're not really going to get that much extra storage out of it. it was, the number is actually in the report. And we also may break the confining layer when we dredge it. And we may not have a bowl to hold water anymore. We just may have a big sieve. And the water goes in and it filters out instead. There, there is a confining layer that holds that water in. And once you break it, then you've kind of you can have a hole in your cup or your bowl. Um, connecting to MWRA, it's very costly. The numbers are in the report. Um, there's a fee for joining MWRA, and then there's a fee for every million gallons of water you want to take out. You're also subject to MWRA's rules. So if the commissioners of MWRA raise the rates for any reason or put a surcharge on you for any type of improvements to their system, we would be subject to the surcharges and rates as well. Next. So this was the summary of the alternatives. Update well four, I mean update well four and baby carriage, centennial, well five, and develop a well in Sunderland. Like I said earlier in the first the slide before, the other four weren't that that good. 
Next. So this is a new slide that was asked to sort of explain the centennial process, why we were moving forward with the centennial process. So when Ty and Bond did a study back in 2007, 8, maybe 9, maybe, um, and they were going to repair the centennial water treatment plant, and all they were going to do was take the existing Roberts filters that are in there. Roberts is a brand name. They're going to take those Roberts filters, redo them, fix some little structural things here and there with the building, fix the little wiring things, and then that was it. It was all going to be back and do the same thing. So they came up with a price of $4 million. We did bond this. We were authorized this in 20, FY 2012. Um, we did, as part of this, we also had to increase the sewer, put a sewer line in, because to do it, we'd have to use, um, we were looking to use alum to help us treat the water and make it settle better. And so we couldn't dump that into the existing system we used for backwash. We had to have it dumped into a sewer system. So we installed a sewer line. Um, the estimate for that was 1.5 million. We actually got in a little lower. And then the other thing is, is Pelham, once you get above the fire station at Pelham, where the fire station is, um, there has to be a pump to pump water above, because it's above our natural grade, operating grade line for the water system. So we had to pump up and improve that uh, pumping station. The estimate was half a million dollars. We came in a little under two. So two of the items were done. Uh, the, the big item, the treatment plant, we stopped and said, no, look, we need to think about this some more. Uh, we had Ty and Bond do a study on dissolved air, dissolved air flotation, which is DAF for an nice acronym. It helps you separate out the organic particulates in the water and then before it goes into the treatment process. So we came up with some numbers of DAF and Tate and Howard came up and figured, figured out a project and how it would work. This was back in 2017 when this report was made. And they were at 7.4 million. There was no changes to the filters and no changes to the building. We were going to take all this equipment, this new equipment, and shove it in the existing building and try to make it work. Um, if you've ever been in the building, it's pretty tight now, and it's not, it's very hard to get anything else in there. Um, we said, well, we can't really do this. We need to do this the correct way because this is the next, this is the next plant that's going to be here for all, more than 50 years or more, so we want to do a little better job. So, and Tate and Howard, we asked them to develop the scope of work for designing the plant. They developed the scope of work for the design. They also came up with a new estimate, and the new estimate changes, completely changes the building. The building will be made to actually house everything in it appropriately and correctly. Um, the whole, well, the existing building basically will be torn down, and we'll move forward from there. Um, so, so that's how we came up with the different prices. People were wondering. Um, and basically, it's as we went along, we saw that there needed to be a little change. Um, the one, $11 million is not, it's not like the locked in stone price. Um, we're asking now for the permitting, designing and permitting number, which is the 692,000. 692, as we move forward with developing the project, We'll see the things that we're capable of doing, the town staff is capable of doing. A lot of the demolition we'll probably be able to do. Some of the connections to the sewer system we'll definitely be able to do. There'll be some things that are in the estimate that the town forces will be able to take off the project and will be able to do it a little cheaper. So the 11 million is kind of the high end, except we have no control over tariffs and steel prices and so forth. Um, we have no control over that. Um, I keep being reminded of that every time I keep talking, that we can make it work a little better, but people remind me there's outside forces that act on us as well. So that's the history of the Centennial Project. Um, so we've always kind of been working on this, always been working towards replacing it. Uh, the tr plant is now offline. It was hit by a lightning storm, and we've some of the mechanics and some of the electronics in the system were broken. When we went to start replacing some of these pieces, we found out that you could not re get the piece that was burnt or destroyed. You could not get that piece anymore. 
So you had to get another piece, and then the piece that you got wasn't compatible with the other pieces it plugged into. Um, it's kind of the way America works, I guess. So we had to upgrade more than the broken pieces. So the price of just making the facility, the price of making the facility work was getting more, getting more advanced, and we were just putting more money just to make the system that didn't work the best work. So we kind of just mothballed the facility. We turned it off. It's now in, in what DEP calls inactive status. We have two choices. We have the choice to continue on and replace the treatment plant and bring it back into operational status, or it'll be, or we will lose the approval to use the source, and it'll lose its 1.5 million gallon per day certification. And we'll have to, if we decide to ever bring it back online, we would have to go back through the certification process which then again gets back into the SWIMI, the sustainable, the sustainable Water Management Initiative, of what they would require us to do, or if they'd even agree to let us have 1.5 million gallons out of that site, out of that facility again. So that's kind of how this all, this is how the prices broke down, this is how the project's been going. Next. So those are the recommendations. And the top two we've been, we've been pursuing for a while, we continue to pursue. The third one we've been working on, um, we have a couple really good leads right now to actually make this work a little cheaper for the town and maybe a little better. The town staff is really not sold on well five yet, so we're just concentrating on the top three. Next. And I think that's it, and I probably said about a million things. I, didn't say last time, and probably forgot to say a million things I said on Thursday, and I apologize. But I'm willing to take questions if anybody has any. Okay, questions. Mandy Jo. So the um, bond that was issued for Centennial, approximately from that slide, about one and a half million of it has been used. Uh, is the other two and a half million available for use? Um, I know there was a, the the recommendation is to pull this 600 out of, I guess, bonded out from something. Is it to bond it out through the bond that's already been authorized, or is it from a different one? It's a new, the design money will come from a new bond. The leftover money from, money from Centennial was reauthorized for water system improvements, and we've been spending that money to improve water lines throughout the town. So that money that we saved and didn't use has been used for other project, water projects. Additional questions? Dorothy. I'm, I'm sorry, Darcy and then Dorothy. I think I asked a question something like this the last time I heard you talk about this. Um, the, the water treatment in general uses a high percentage of the municipal electricity. Is that correct? If you count the wastewater treatment plant, the water treatment facilities, we are the we are the lion's share of the town's electrical use. So, is there um, is are any of these upgrades to the Centennial plant aimed at um, making it more energy efficient? Yes, and actually, as an overall practice, we work constantly to try and make things more efficient. Replacing a steady state motor, which runs a well with a variable speed motor, is one of the biggest things we can do to actually save electricity. Because when you run a motor at, at a speed you don't really need to run it at, just because you can only run it at that speed, you're wasting electricity. So we routinely work in the wastewater and water side to put variable speed controllers into our systems for the, uh, all the motors throughout all those facilities. Um, we have a project we're getting ready to do at the um, West Street Wastewater Pump Station, which will take motors that are on or off and replace those with variable speed drives as well. So as we go through these, we do try to lower our electrical consumption and lower any type of consumption. We try to lower the chemical consumption. We lower, try to lower the waste we create. Um, we create waste by when the filters get clogged, we have to flush the filters out with clean water. Uh, the better we can operate the system and reduce the amount of times we have to backwash the system, uh, reduces energy usage, and it also reduces inter, uh, water waste. So we, we, do, we work constantly to try to improve those. So if we do this, we would be going for the most efficient facility we can do. And would you say that Tata and Howard 
um, is how would they rate as far as a engineering firm that is knowledgeable about sustainability issues? As far as sustainability issues, they understand the water and wastewater industry, more the water industry with us. Um, they know how to make the system work better and how you how to get the best product you can at the lowest cost you can possibly get it at. There's going to be some cost to doing this. There's no way to do it without any cost or without any like power of some type. Uh, but they have done several plants recently. I mean, they continuously do plants for other communities and they're continuously working on making it a better process. Better meaning more energy efficient? Energy efficient, water efficient, all those things. Less chemicals, they, they try to reduce everything. Okay, Dorothy, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, um, if you can't, or if we don't restore Centennial to use and we have a big drought, um, can we get by? Uh, so if you stroll up to the numbers at the very top, keep going. Uh, nope, go down to, go down, go that right there, that's it. So that's what we're permitted to use now. So right now today, or actually third, this is Thursday's number, we were using 3.4 million gallons. That was our average daily use. Um, when the students are not, not here, we use about 2.6. When the students are here, it's about 3.4 to 4. So as you see, we have 4.4 and we have 7 million gallons. If we lose 1.5 million gallons, you have less to play with and less to use. Uh, you have 4.4 out of one bowl, and you have 1.5 out of another bowl, and you've lost the third bowl. So. Right now, we tend to run, well, since Centennial is off, when Centennial was working, we actually ran a third of the water from Atkins, a third from Centennial, and a third from the Lawrence Swamp Wells is how we ran the system. So you'll, you'll be missing one of your bowls. Shalini. So first, I appreciate you making the presentation all over again for us. Thank you. Um, and I, I also want to highlight what you said to a share, so that was shared last time that what happens if we don't invest in this and there's a chance that we lose this investment on this property. Yeah, right. yes, if we don't invest, if we don't upgrade the system, the possibility of losing the certification for the facility is, is real. DEP has told us in five years, um, I think the clock started ticking last month, um, they will decertify it and it won't be, we can't use it as a source. Um, if you think about what we've invested in, can you scroll down one slide? Um, if you look, well you can't really see the, you can kind of see the two reservoirs, they're below where it says Pelham Reservoir, there's two little big blue spots. Those are the reservoirs and we own a lot of land, we purchased a lot of land around those reservoirs to protect the source of water as well. So those are the, those are purchases we would, lose if we lose the source as well. It's not just the actual water. We would have made a lot of investments for nothing, so. Additional questions? Alyssa. I'm sorry, at the very beginning of this presentation, did you say we were doing a forum on the 23rd? And if so, what is that all about? Okay. For both this and Hickory Ridge, we are required to have a public forum before we uh, vote. And so the schedule is as follows. At the beginning of our regular meeting on the 23rd, we will hold two public forums in succession, unless for some reason Nick Ridge isn't ready. But it'll be, one of them will be on the Centennial plant, the other one will be on Hickory Ridge. The next day, Finance Committee meeting will be meeting and they will discuss these and be prepared to make a recommendation back to the council. And should, we be, should they be completed with their work on the 24th, it'll come back to the council on, on October 7th. Andy. Yeah, I would just add um, reference to section 5.6 of the charter. Are there other questions of Mr. Mooring? Kathy. 
Um, can you go back to the chart that shows the total costs the, that got up to 11? Um, in, in trying to read the original report, which is my first time through a report like this, at times it indicated that when you're in the construction part of it, a, a portion of that is engineering and design. And then there's an overage of engineering design. And I'm just wondering the first one, which is the design, how much, how many pieces of design are there? And is there there's some flexibility in all of this that it's all wrapped into one? So that was one question I have. And then in the report itself, it said it gave us an alternative of not running Centennial year round, but running it just in the cold, not in the warm weather months. And so I'm assuming this is running it year round, because it said you want to go up to DAF, this new treatment thing, if you're running it. So just describe a we need it year round versus, so not closing it down, but running it without as much of an upgrade. So um, as I was telling you, we got struck by lightning and some of the components inside were broken and destroyed. Uh, we cannot run the facility at all right now. So the facility is totally offline. We were running it, partially running it, um, before the lightning strike, and then um, th that was why the 2017 report was actually before the lightning strike, and that's why they talk about it. So in the past, we had been running it that way, and we also we had shut it down. Um, pre predominantly, we'd shut down Centennial end of July, August, um, mostly because those are the stormy se stormy weather season. Um, it's amazing what you have to learn when you're, you do this. <laughs> Because it's really stormy, and, we, and the Pelham reservoirs are so small, it talks about how the water can be have uh, poor quality sometimes. It's mostly during the season of thunderstorms and rain events, because when a big thunderstorm comes in and stirs up the bowl you're getting your water out of, you have a lot more sediment to treat, and it's a lot harder to treat. So we would shut the facility down in July, or August and September when those storms are usually coming through. And that's why it was said that way in the um, report, because predominantly there's not a lot of storms in the winter, and the water quality in the winter is great. That's a very good water quality in the winter when you're not having a lot of storms stirring it up. Your other question was about construction costs, design costs? To the extent that we've got a, a design and engineering cost of 700000 then we've got a construction cost. And in the report, it's and then also one other one. And so there were in concept. So in the way the report was written, it, it made it seem like the engineering was embedded in the construction costs. So I'm just wondering if there are three parts of this engineering design of the plant. There's, there's really two parts of the engineering part. There is the design and permitting part, which you're seeing, which is a 692,000. That's a fixed number not to exceed that the consultant has agreed to, 692,000. There will be a part when we start actually constructing the project where we need to bring in the consultant to do specialized things that we don't do to oversee um, some of the com complex wiring and kind of some of the complex installation of, of equipment. That's something that they come in and, and yes, it's a little expensive to have them do it. Um, their estimate for this project is based on a percentage. It's not based on an actual number. We won't have an actual number of that until they actually design it and get it through per permitting. So uh, the placeholder for that number is the 1.1. Pat. When you're, talking about, you're talking about replacing the whole building. What could be saved, or can you get information about alternatives? One is expanding the building that exists or replacing it entirely, which is what you're talking about. Uh, there, there is. <laughs> so the building, can you go up to the picture of the building? Right there. So the building was built very inexpensively when it was first built. It's a very basic uh, pre-engineered uh, pre metal building. There's uh, beams and columns inside. They hold some stringers. And then the outside paneling is just attached to it. And there's insulation on the inside. Most of the inside at the bottom, the bottom two or three feet, that is rusted on the inside because there's a lot of condensation that stays in the building. So almost none of the siding is really worth saving. It's not worth it at all. Some of the structural beams could probably be saved and used for something else or for a smaller piece of the new building. 
Um, and that's up for the engineer to, to look at as they design the new building and, and what we need for space. But most of what you see as the outside cladding is useless. It's pretty much useless. But then there's not much else inside the building. It's just a big open space inside. Actually, it's two open spaces. Did that answer your? Yes and no. I guess I'm still like, I'm thinking, why, can, why not just replace the metal walls? Why not? Are there, all, and I don't know, but are there, are there alternatives to creating a whole new building that would work? Yeah, we've, we've looked at it. We've tried to fit all this equipment inside, and it's not very efficient and not very good. Um, we, you're, I'm welcome to come up and we can show you the th different things that should have been done differently in the original design, which were not. They were kind of just done the way they were because there was space to stick it and they st put it there. And it's not the best place for it to be. Um, the generator is actually in the filter room. The filter room, like I say, sweats a great deal because the temperature of the water is, is usually cooler than the outside temperature. So it's, it's, there's a lot of condensation in there. So you have the electrical generator and the switch gear all sitting in the same room. So that's getting corroded faster than normal because of that situation. It should be in another room. It should be isolated so it doesn't have those more climate control, not just in this wet room. So there's things like that. And I'm, ha I'm happy to show you if you'd like to come up and look. Please wear sensible shoes and pants if you come. <laughs> Kathy. No, no, I forgot to ask. When, we, when you came and presented to finance, I asked you whether you could give us a range estimate of the likely impact on water rates, not, not just for the design phase, but along, and we're talking maybe two years from now. And I don't know whether you have them now, but we were hoping that you would have them in time for the public hearing. We, we will have them for the public hearing. Okay, so there'd be one more chart that would give us, I mean, we. In the draft report we've done from the Finance Committee, we got a rough estimate of just the first $700,000. Um, right. Okay. So it will be available. So that's what, what I thought when Alyssa was saying, we're doing this additional meeting. I think it'll be important for people to know what they can expect. Andy. Yeah, I just um, want to follow up on questions that Darcy was asking much earlier. Is it possible during the engineering study work to look at the amount of land we have up there, which is quite a bit, whether there's any possibility of solar panels, the cost of solar panel installation, the amount of electricity that could be generated, what the payback might be for doing that approach? is a part of the overall engineering work? Uh, yes, you, you, we can do that. There's one restriction on watershed land for doing solar projects or wind projects. Those solar and wind projects must be used by the facility or the water system. They're not to be a development just to give solar panel to a neighborhood. So if we were able to set it up so that it worked for the actual treatment plant. It's something that's possible to do under the permitting by DEP. This building is under the water um, so, trust fund, right? Or fund. Yeah, yeah, it's the Water Enterprise Fund. Thank you. And that technically, that actually is not subject to the zero energy bylaw. Am I correct on that, Mr. Bachman? I'm not positive of that answer. I the, think we there, probably should get that answer. Yeah, there yes. is in this in the net zero energy bylaw the fact that uh, power to run process equipment is exempt from the net zero energy bylaw. Um, power to run the building, yeah. well, I guess that's lights, would be probably the only thing that falls under the net zero energy right. bylaw. But we, because we do use such a large amount of power in the process equipment, and the process equipment is the process equipment, um, that was exempted in the bylaw. Okay, but we still might, we still would like to look into putting some additional energy sources here. 
Okay. Everything we save saves on the rate and keeps things working better for us. So okay. uh, water and sewer funds are pretty frugal and pretty, we're pretty good when we do, we, we look mm -hmm. a lot, we have to. Right. Uh, Mandy Joe. So something Andy said got me thinking, how large is the property where Centennial is located? So the actual piece of property the plant sits on is uh, n not that big. It's about four, three and a half maybe acres. Okay. It's not very big. So it's not big enough to think about putting portions of not, I mean, I know it wouldn't fit all of DPW, but portions of offices or something for DPW up there? Uh, no. Okay. There's, a, there's, other, there's better choices if you did that. Nice try. <laughs> uh, yes, Dorothy. Um, I, I think you answered this before, but when you, we, you take out a bond, and then water rates help pay down that bond. So how much would the town of Amherst or the people of Amherst have to pay beyond the water rates that we would be paying? The enterprise system is totally self-sufficient. If this enterprise system bonds this $11 million, the rate payers of the water system pay for paying off the bond. If you're a taxpayer in town and you're on a well, you pay nothing to pay off this bond. Guilty as charged. Um, Mandy Jones. I was just going to say, so then that means that UMass and Amherst College and Hampshire College who get water from our water system would help pay off this bond because they pay our water rates. Everyone right. who's on our system, which includes some houses in Belchertown, some houses in Pelham, um, I think there's, yeah, Belchertown, Pelham, and all the people who were watered in Amherst, which includes the colleges and the large apartment complexes, will pay as well. It's not just the resident, uh, the single family homes who would pay. Okay, are there additional questions? Yes, Dorsey. Uh, I was wondering if you know of any other municipalities that use their own in house um, staff to put in geothermal? Uh, I, I don't think anybody uses their own in-house staff for actually installing the geothermal wells. Um, Just wondering if that would be cost effective to, to, to t train staff to be able to do that for all of our municipal buildings. Just randomly came up with that thought this moment. <laughs> Well, I, I can give you more information <laughs> on a project we're work, working on with the Mass Center for Mass CEC, Clean Energy Center, right? I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. I always mess it up. Um, we have a grant from Mass CEC. We're working with UMass Amherst plus a, a, a business in Rhode Island to actually look at um, some heat, pump, heat pumps they use in China. And the, the grant is to install a pilot facility at our wastewater treatment plant and the facility would use the wastewater as the heating source and the process that this company has um, takes that energy and uses it for cooling and cooling and heating. Don't know, I mean, they say it works in China and it does a great job. Um, this will be the first time they do it in America. Um, so it's a grant we have. Like I say, we're, we're always pushing, water and sewer is always pushing the envelope a little harder. Are there other questions from the council at this time? We're going to reserve questions about this for, from the general public for the hearing, I mean for the forum. Uh, but I want to make sure that the council has generally covered what they need to cover at this time, knowing that this will go back to the finance committee and then come back to the council for a vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. We're moving on to the 26th Spring Street, uh, and I believe we have a couple people here. Uh, Kyle?
There we go. Dave Williams, Archipelago. Kyle Wilson from Archipelago Investments. Okay. Thank you for your time tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we are here before you uh, to discuss a condition from uh, our 26 Spring Street project approvals that uh, were approved last year uh, as it relates to a uh, handicap drop-off area in uh, the front of the building on the town sidewalk. We've submitted uh, the conditions 33. It is included on the submittal that we sent in. That's the second page and then there's a first page if you could pop up. Uh, so this is a uh, plan that was submitted to the planning board at the end of August and was approved. The uh, handicap drop-off is shown uh, specifically in highlighted in yellow. Uh, on the top portion of the drawing, it shows the pitches uh, associated with that, which we reviewed with the planning board, uh, meaning how uh, the slope of the ramps as it comes from the sidewalk down to the street surface. The, the lower portion of the drawing just shows materiality, uh, which is continuing the, the existing sidewalk to either side of it and striping in the roadway. And uh, the condition reads, a final drawing of a proposed accessible drop-off area in front of the building in the town right-of-way shall be submitted to the planning department for review. After review by the planning department, the drawing shall then be submitted to the select board. Obviously, this was last year. Uh, for review prior to the issuance of a building permit, the select board may then decide whether to approve or not approve the drop-off area. Uh, the second slide, uh, shows what is existing. So that picture was taken last week. Uh, and the drop-off area as proposed is essentially right where the current uh, driveway and drive aisle exists. So the sidewalk is almost identical. It would need to be uh, slightly different in terms of pitch, but is uh, effectively right where the drive aisle uh, currently exists. So uh, we will need to be back before you at a future date for um, other uh, elements, including uh, work in the public right-of-way. But tonight, we were before you just for uh, the purpose of reviewing condition 33. This is the first time that this project has come before this body. So um, I believe any additional information that you were able to provide, and we did receive a, a serious package about this, would be useful. Um, this, the reason this comes before us tonight is because it's a request regarding the public way, and we are the keepers of the public way, and this is a permanent request regarding the public way. So um, if there are any additional things you'd like to talk about with regard to the entire project, that would be welcome. Okay. Uh, I th think that uh, as it relates to the public way, uh, back last year when, we, when this project was before the planning board, we presented a couple different options, one of which had uh, looked at uh, having street trees out in the street rather than uh, parking and in working with the planning board. Uh, and working with the Disability Access uh, Committee. Uh, the street trees, the proposed street trees out in the street were removed, parking was maximized, and a, uh, a drop-off area was integrated into the, uh, the public way at the, at the street. Uh, so I think, again, what our intent today was to really, uh, you know, not take too much of your time and just discuss the, uh, the uh, this this one condition number 33 uh, rather than reviewing uh, everything that the planning board has gone over and approved up until this point okay. are there questions from the council Steve so uh, I might be uh, able to add a little bit because I was the chair of the planning board at the time that this condition was put in and uh, so the first question to myself is, we knew at the time that the select board was going away, so I'm not sure exactly why we referred to the, I think that we probably have anticipated a more accelerated schedule, but it, we should have said that it sh shall be submitted to the select board or to the town council. So 
As far as I remember, this is not a requirement. So this is basically an Correct. amenity. So it's not a requirement by the town that this exists. And, it would, and the planning board has no authority. The reason that it's here now is that the planning board has no authority to make requirements that go beyond the boundaries of the property that's being developed. So if it's something that extends into the public way, then it always got referred to the keepers of the public way. So we're here to discuss whether or not we think it's a good idea to have this drop off. And as far as I understand, because it's not a requirement of the project, we can decide that it's not a good idea. We can decide it's a great idea. We can decide it should be somewhere else. But that's really what the limit of our right. discussion is. Right. Thank you for that question. Mandy Joe. So I have two. The first one is the plans that you submitted don't show any signage about the drop off. Um, is there an intent to put signs up that say this is for drop off loading, active loading only, or anything like that? So I'm curious about how you would define it as a loading zone or a drop off zone and how you would indicate that um, on your property or whether you just expect the town to do that and who would pay for it. And, and number two is the area looks kind of tiny to me for a car. When I'm looking at that area right there um, on that drawing, which is why I tried to get hold of many other drawings, um, it looks very short to me. And so one of my concerns is that it's not actually easily accessible to pull into the spot easily and then pull out of the spot easily without having to back up and actually parallel park. And if that's the case, I'm concerned that no one will actually do that and they'll just block the actual driving lane for loading. So I'd like you to address the length of that and is it really that short, one car length? Sure, and um, the first question regarding the signage, uh, we are open to any signage that uh, working with DPW, working with uh, whoever manages the signage in town, uh, we'd obviously be willing to pay for that signage. We wouldn't be looking to have the town pay for that and we'll be open to whatever guidance is given there. Um, in regards to the drop-off area, uh, the intent was to make it uh, approximately the size of a parking space. And in conversations with the planning board, when we were before the planning board, the conversation was, do we want street trees or do we want parking? And parking was the, uh, uh, the agreed upon uh, direction. And so the intent was to try to make it work within the context of uh, parking spaces in the street. Uh, this this uh, uh, drawing shows the parking that extends to the east from that Mazda all the way to Churchill Street, and there's parking that extends to the west from uh, the yellow drop-off area all the way up to uh, Boltwood, and uh, would be work willing to work with DPW on restriping to maximize the spaces. Not all of these are, are maximized in terms of, I believe the current standard is a 20-foot parking space. I believe some of these are significantly larger than that. So if there were some efficiencies that could be had outside of the bounds of this project, uh, we'd be willing to, um, to work with those. Additional questions? Kathy. I'm sorry, Kathy. Um, I, I know we just heard that we should be focused just on this space, but I'm wondering if you could tell us is the sidewalk, I'm looking at the buildings, um, is that sidewalk wide enough for two wheelchairs to pass each other? Uh, that sidewalk is five feet wide. Is that wide enough for two wheelchairs to pass each other? Uh, in all new construction, the doorways are the, the main limiter of that, and usually a three-foot opening for doorways is required for a wheelchair. So I don't believe, I don't know this, if, if two next to one another can fit on five feet, uh, but usually within a building, a three-foot door opening is required for two so wheelchairs. It sounds like it's probably not wide enough. Um, if I'm just looking at the design, the, it, they don't show any telephone poles or utility poles, and are those all going under the ground? Uh, yes. So <laughs> one of the things that we have worked on in advance of this project coming for a building permit is working with Eversource to 
look to bury the power lines on Spring Street. And that's the development is paying for the cost of that? Correct. And when, when, if those go underground, is that part of the reason the transformer idea was coming to us? So I'm wondering if the back of the building has enough space to put the transformer that they wanted to put above ground on the commons? The transformer uh, for the building is not related to the common in any way. The upgrades to the system that I understand Eversource wants to do as part of burying the power lines was the reason for uh, the request that they made uh, uh, on the common. But would it, is there space behind the building for something six feet wide, three feet, six feet tall, three feet wide, deep, and five feet wide? Uh, no, our transformer will be in the front. Yours, yours will be in front of the building, Correct. above ground? Correct. So somewhere in this picture, there will be a transformer? Correct. So It will not be in the, right of, in the town right of way. Right. So the, the pictures, the visuals I'm looking at aren't quite the way anything would look right now um, in terms of where that would be. And I think you're telling me that there's not room behind the building to put something that's the system upgrade as a result of things going under the ground. Uh, there's not enough, like five feet behind the building before it comes up against the police station. Yeah, Mr. Bachman. Uh, yes, I, I don't think the, the location matters for where the transformer is. So they're taking a transformer that's in front of Hastings and they wanted to right. upgrade that transformer in order to create a loop. And, uh, okay. So it, putting a transformer at so this it, location it wouldn't, wouldn't help it, them at it's, all. It wouldn't be a good location for it. Right, because the, the need for the transformer is in front of Hastings or somewhere in that proximity. Okay, because I thought it was related to them putting everything underground and now they need the extra capacity. They, it, you know, it, it, it's my memory from the last time, you know. It's address it? That's okay. Um, that's, can I ask Mr. Mooring to address Mr. Mooring, please. So, so um, what's going on with the petition you have from Eversource is there's an existing electrical utility system which runs down South Pleasant Street. There's a transformer that's in front of Hastings. It's underground. If you stand at Hastings, you'll see the little access vents. That transformer needs to be replaced so that they can then do a loop over to tie into the Spring Street power. Right now, Spring Street gets its power only from the east, and it comes up Spring Street and it stops after the Lord Jeff and the church over here. Over there, sorry, at the church. Um, and what Eversource wants to do is connect that power line to the line on South Pleasant Street so they have a loop. So if something breaks in there, they'll get power from either direction. Um, so the transformer they want to replace is an existing transformer, and it's um, needs to be in the Hastings area. It needs to be close to Hastings so they can serve, continue to serve the line which runs up and down South Pleasant Street. This. So we're really talking two different transformers. One is the transformer associated with the actual building. And the other one is the transformer associated with Eversource. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and if I may, this project could proceed without the burial of the power lines. While we're on the issue, what will be the street lighting if we bury the pole, if we get rid of the poles and the power lines? Uh, the street lighting currently is uh, uh, st street lights that were installed when Spring Street was regraded back in 05, 2005, and 2006. Mm -hmm. So they were pulled off of the poles and our street lights that are in the grass median to the west and in the grass median to the east. And it's sufficient lighting for security and safety? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I can't really tell from the drawings how much space there is uh, on the sides of the building, but um, it, it seems kind of tight. How do you get rid of trash? Do you have dumpsters? Uh, can a vehicle service the building 
on that street? Uh, yes, all of, all of that was reviewed by the planning board um, and approved, uh, and the trash comes out of the side of the building and out to the uh, street, similar to the Lord Jeff across the street. Okay. Alyssa? So I don't know how to put this delicately. I keep waiting for the light bulb to go off, and I don't understand what we're being asked to do. All we have many beautiful pictures. We have a drawing that shows that little ecru thing that has nothing to do with any of these pictures. None of it's laid out as how it will look against any of these pictures. I have no idea why I would make a decision about this based on the drawings we have. And I wonder if there's another drawing that can be put up there that can kind of overlay and with a pointer or whatever. I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy. But I'm sitting here looking at all of you going, am I the only one who doesn't get what this looks like? Because <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of beautiful pictures of the building and I'm totally fine with all the work the planning board already did. I'm just not understanding what this drop off is gonna look like. I'm seeing a yellow stripe in front of a vacant lot. That's not telling me anything. The question is, what, where is the drop off in relationship to the pictures we see of the building? I mean, we see this, this example. A frontage picture. Yeah. Yes. So I should note that the, the applicant submitted the things that you were just looking at. This additional documentation was put in your packet at the request of one of the council members. Yes. So they did not submit these. These are grabbed from a different permitting process. Okay. Very good. Go back to the actually I don't know what it's Is it original? You can you can see the stairs going up uh, yes. in the middle there. Go back to the plan and you'll see those stairs. There you go. And right there. And, I, and the drop off is where the golden area is correct. on the schematic design. So it's right there. Correct. Where the bike is. Where the bike is. The bike. Yeah. Right. So what's missing then? I guess we're being asked to just allow restriping of the street is at, with some signage that it's a loading zone. Is that essentially what we would vote to do? Yes, so the planning board said, and the Disability Access Commission said, we'd like there to be a drop-off area in front of your building. They can't tell them, as, as Steve said, they can't tell them to do that, and they, but they said, go ask the town council if you can do that, because that would, we would like that to happen. So they're here before you to say, we'd like to, we've been asked to ask you to put this loading zone in front of the building, and so that's why they're here. And again, it's not a condition of their permit, but they, they have to, a condition of their permit is that they have to ask you. Okay, got it. Yes, Dorothy. Um, so if it's marked as a loading zone, then it's not an Uber zone, is that right? Uh, I think the conversations in front of the planning board were related to how could you combine those uses in, so in one location. It's for a vehicle to stop and drop either off. take on or drop off Correct. passengers. And is it- In an accessible manner. In an accessible manner. Correct. And then am I looking at the, this picture that we have up here? Is the accessible uh, accessibility to the building all the way on the far right? Mm -hmm. The accessibility would be approximately from the stair in that stone wall to the end of the rendering. Okay. And, and probably the best image is, uh, unfortunately, we have not uh, redrawn the, the rendering on the existing Photograph, but that second, this image here. Uh, uh, as you can see, it's it's hard even in a photograph to discern the the very minimal slopes that will be uh, a part of this area. So, and it's effectively almost in the exact same location as the current. So, another alternative would be, you know, uh, we don't want a loading area. Uh, we'd like it to all be parking and we'd like the sidewalk to remain at the five or six inches that it is all the way across the site. And that's obviously another option that's, that's available. And if that's the case, however, there's really no change in what we presently have. 
there would be a change because it there is would, currently kind of accessible. Right, I got it. Um, Thank but you. there would not be a change from uh, from a standard curb installation in front of a building. Okay. And they, then the accessibility would be at the end of block because it's accessible at Boltwood, the corner mm -hmm. of Boltwood and Spring, and it's accessible at the corner of uh, Spring and Churchill. And so rather than having that be the only accessibility uh, options, the request was, can we make it closer? And we said yes, and then we had to come before the keeper of the public way to make, have that discussion. Right. Lisa. So I'm still not seeing how that yellow thing goes up some stairs to be accessible. And somebody was talking about to the right, to the left, please help me out here. What are we talking about? Go so, over a bicyclist, go over those plantings, because so, if you're dropping off, then you're not sent, are you sending so, them right or left anyway? So there's, there's two, there's two uh, public spaces in this building that meet the street. Uh, the lobby is on the right, and you can see uh, uh, the lobby entrance there is on the right, and it's fully accessible, as all uh, new buildings are required to be. And then there's a ramp to the left, which is just off this rendering, that ramps all the way up, and this is a cafe that's on uh, the first floor uh, that is also fully accessible. So the entire building would be fully accessible from the sidewalk. So where's the yellow? The, so the yellow thing, we have not updated this rendering, um, but the, the yellow thing would be, it would be the, a slight slope right in the middle between the two bikers there, and there would be uh, a drop off with any striping and signage that was deemed appropriate. So they could go right up there for, for that or, correct, okay. or come from uh, Churchill or come from Boltwood or uh, anywhere else on the public sidewalk out off the site. They can do that now. So I'm saying Correct. if it's going to be an advantage, then it doesn't need to drop off to stairs because that's not an advantage. It needs to drop off close to one of those ramps. Otherwise, okay. just go to the corners. What's the difference? It's well, I, I think that the I think the intent was to try to make it work with the existing parking and the existing site and. Um, at that point, it was undetermined whether or not the ability to bury the power lines was going to be an option. And so we couldn't have proposed it in one of the little Kirby things around the poles that were left over in the street when the town and Amherst College did the, all, the, all the work to regrade the street. So it was proposed in the middle of the site so that if the people getting dropped off were going to the cafe, they could go to the left. If they were going to the apartments, they were going to the right and the stairs were, were not considered because obviously they're not accessible. They're a second means of access. Okay, Shalini. I think this is for Paul from the smart street perspective. Is there something we need to be complying with in terms of the sidewalks or anything pertaining to that? Uh, well, smart street is a different, pro or complete streets, I think you're, you might be thinking about. It's a totally different thing in terms of when you reconstruct a road. This is simply uh, designating a parking location on the street as a drop-off area, and whether you would like to see that or if you would like not like to see that. So, that, yeah, it do I don't think this complete streets would apply to this. Are there additional questions from the council? Yes, Evan. So I want to make sure a little closer than I expected. I want to make sure I'm understanding the debate that we're having. So right now there is no parking space there. So if we designate this as a drop off, we don't lose a parking space. Correct. We, pretty much nothing changes as far as usability of that physical space. If we decide we don't want one there, we have the potential to gain a paid parking space. And so the decision before us, regardless of all this other conversation we seem to be having is, do we want to gain a parking space or do we want to keep it as is and designate it as accessible drop-off? That's my understanding of the decision um, we have before us. It, not mine. Okay. The request before us is that as they do this construction, Will we accept the fact that they're going to do a drop-off, accessible drop-off area in the right-of-way? Right now, it is actually accessible because of a quirk, but is it going to stay that way, or are we going to gain a parking space? So that's what you've said, right? Okay. Steve. So now this is a question, but we should also be clear that this is not just for this building, right? So this could be, this will not be signed just for your building. Correct. So, yeah. That's correct. Okay. Additional questions, Darcy. It's, 
Um, my understanding that there there's no parking in the building. Is that correct? Correct. So it would seem like this would make sense because there are going to be a lot of people living in that building who may not have cars. Mm -hmm. So they might need to be dropped off. Mm -hmm. So okay. more of a need for this building than, say, say other buildings. Okay. Dorothy? Well, I don't see that we gain a space if you don't use the existing driveway for where there was a road that could become a parking space. I think, it, I think the number of parking spaces stays the same. Um, the question is, do, is this going to be accessible? And I guess the thing that worries me the most is that I think the sidewalks seem to be not quite wide enough. I'm assuming, however, that the planning board has dealt with that issue. Well, the, the sidewalks are matching the existing sidewalks that are there on both sides. And are they to the standards of the code of the town. Uh, I'm town looking at the chair of our planning board. Over these here. are these are these are the sidewalks that the town installed in 0506. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, Mandy Jo. I, mean, I don't have a question. I just I'm concerned that it's not long enough to make it easily usable as a drop-off pickup area, and we'll still end up with double parking, even though there's a big wide space there that can't be used. So I. It, I think we're going to try and refer this maybe tonight. If so, I would love to have someone figure out maybe what length is logical for an actual pull-in, pull-out without having to back up and essentially parallel park. Okay. The options before the council are either to approve this or to refer to CRC. Um, and, yes, Steve. I think there's a really important step here, which if you read the condition, that um, they, they can't get a billing permit until they've gone through this process. Right. So I think we need to acknowledge that it has been submitted to the town council so that they can get their, you know, get their billing permit. A lot of this conversation, <laughs> we're really kind of talking about paint, right? So there's going to be a big construction site here, you know, assuming that you get your billing permit. Um, this will be a big construction site. So I'm wondering if we can't actually have this discussion sort of further in the construction process where there's an actual, you know, a building to look at because the sidewalk will get damaged. The, there will be a lot of work. Well, I guess that's an open question also. But there will be a lot of movement across the sidewalk for the construction of the building. So do we have to decide this right now or can we... The, my understanding is that because of the way this was set up, in order to get the permit, we have to resolve this issue. They will be coming back to us as they move into construction, asking for use of the public way for the purposes of construction. That won't be a permanent use of the public way, but it will be a long-term use of the public way. So there is a separate request, but I'm understanding that this request stands between them and a building permit. Mr. Bockelman. The way the condition reads is that the drawing has to be submitted to the, to the select board. It doesn't say you have to approve it or not approve it. It just says they have to submit it and bring it and meet with you. If, if that's the condition, it was a check looking at the planning board chair. So, so we don't need to vote. They fulfilled their requirement for this condition. Okay. However, the question is whether or not the council would like to vote. I just want to say this is the first time the whole issue of planning, zoning, and construction has come to the council. Okay. So we're still figuring out sure. what is our role and what is the role of planning and zoning? And we appreciate your patience in uh, helping us do that education for ourselves. Okay. Well, and, and if yes. I may, I, I think that the, the, the process of, of the planning board, which reviews all of this, that then seeks some improvements outside of the bounds of the planning board, uh, seems to work well, because then 
those improvements can, outside of the building itself, come before the town council now, mm -hmm. and the town council could shift in priorities from the time the, the building is approved till the time it's constructed, and things like the power lines, which could now be buried, mm -hmm. which could get rid of the little uh, concrete curb things, and could end up restriping the parking all the way from the greenway at Grace Church all the way to the east at Churchill, could result in additional parking spaces, or the town could decide it's all street trees, or the town could decide it's all bike parking, or things outside of the bounds of the project itself. And I think that works well. So when the request was made, could you show us what drop-off would look like? We said, sure, and we submitted that with right. the understanding that we would come before the select board and now town council at some point and begin this conversation. And right. I think as the town manager said, I don't think the intent is to resolve all that because there's a lot of other questions that, that, that um, have, uh, that relate to things outside of the project itself that still need to be resolved and may take months to resolve. Right. Um, right. So, Paul, it seems to me that this is really not an action item. Well, at some point you do have to make a decision about it. Um, so I think referral to, to CRC. Does, are we standing between them and a permit? No. Okay. Because if you read the condition, it says must submit. It doesn't say must submit and receive approval because they couldn't require that. Okay. That way Got we're it. having this conversation before the building's complete rather than after it's complete. Okay. So, yeah, I understand that. Um, any other comments from the council? Yes, Steve. So if we do nothing or if we vote this down, mm -hmm. uh, then what happens? We get a parking space, but then who, who does the drawing showing the, yeah. I think we'd like to work with you to come up with the right solution, yes. whatever that is. If it's determined that this should be two street right. trees or a drop-off area or additional parking, mm -hmm. we would do that drawing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments at this time? We did list this as having public comment. I understand we have at least one person who would like to comment. Please come forward. Don't go away, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, I would like to echo Councillor Haneke's and Councillor DeAngelis's concern of how wide the parking area is. Obviously, we can see the schematic design isn't completely accurate on how wide the street is itself. But if we're going to have a bus pull in there or like a handicapped school bus for dropping a handicapped student off or if we're going to end up having a line of cars and all the parking spaces are full, then p the vehicles are going to be lining up in the street and that's going to create a line of sight hazard as you drive around those vehicles and with this being right next to the police department, if they're trying to respond to an emergency through that line of vehicles, it's going to create a lot more difficulty for them as well as residents trying to drive up that street when you have a bus that's poking its rear end out into traffic or having a line of vehicles sort of using the street as a temporary parking area to line up traffic. So I just want us to Consider this concern as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other comments on this at this time? Public comment. Oh, there. Back to the council. Lissa. So if we end up referring this or we just agree to it now with the idea that somehow we'll see it again magically anyway, is I don't, I know I'm not, I am in some fashion, I suppose, responding to public comment. I don't believe there was ever any intention that this was going to be long enough for any type of school bus of any kind, that this was only a car length car. And so if it was to be a handicap accessible van that is by its nature even a little more difficult to parallel park, um, then that would something I would want the re body we refer this to to work on a little bit more, because that seems like a logical thing that might be doing drop off is one of those oversized vans. Um, but not 
we would not, at this point, we've never discussed the idea of it being a bus of any kind, whether it's PVTA or another bus. But I do appreciate the idea of someone in a wheelchair that may be in a specially equipped van that isn't just a van that has special controls. Okay. Um, so we have a couple options. We can either approve this, we can refer it, or we can just say thank you for filing your request with us. Uh, is there a wish of the council? Mary, Andy, Mandy Jo. I'd move to refer to CRC for, I guess, re-looking at the whole street for restriping and length of drop-off and all of that. Is there a second? We have a motion. This is to refer the proposal by Archipelago Investments uh, to the Community Resource Committee with a report back to the Town Council on a date that we'll identify. Is there? Yes. So The motion was far more specific than that. You were actually asking not just for a report on this drop-off, right. but on the entire street. I, I think that that lane of street needs looked at if we're going to be looking at one drop-off area, yes. Okay, so would you like to word the motion the way you want it then? Um, to refer? Can I see your papers? Oh, I'm sorry. I figured you all had the motions. Um, uh, move to refer the proposal by Archipelago Investments. Um, and the entire spring, the Spring Street North Side parking from Boltwood to Churchill um, to the Community Resources Committee with a report to Town Council by what we got 45 days, so whatever that is under the rules. That brings us back to the Council for October 21st. 21st. Is there a second? I would second it with the addition of with new, with new up-to-date drawings. Okay. Is there, and that's an acceptable friendly amendment? That's fine. It would have to come okay. back with drawings. All right. The motion's been made in second. Who would like to speak to the motion? Anybody? Or comments about the motion? So yes, the, Evan. Are, this motion has inherent within it the requirement that they submit within the next 45 days updated drawings to CRC based on a, based on CRC's study of an entire street striping that might change what those drawings would look like? I don't see how this works. I, I guess yeah. my thought on the drawings is you'd have to produce a drawing of Spring Street from Boltwood to Churchill showing where the new striping would be and what the proposal for all of that striping and drop-off zone would be. That's my thought on the drawings. I don't know what Dorothy's was. So not necessarily Archipelago submitting the drawings, but DPW working with CRC to come up with the new striping design. Right. I'd like to recognize Guilford Morin. Just... Uh, at Guilford Morning, Superintendent of Public Works. Just to uh, <clears throat> kind of, you're being very uh, detailed in what you're asking for, and what's going on is probably a little less detailed than you think. Um, Archipelago has talked about tre street trees, has talked about drop-off zones, about adding parking. Maybe you just want a concept, not a fully fledged, worked out drawing of the whole street, but a concept of what can be there. You know, if we actually change the spacing and the, if we get rid of the, power lines, we can change the spacing, you can have this many uh, parking spaces, or you can have this many parking spaces and maybe two tree planters, or you can have the drop-off area, or maybe you can have a larger drop-off area. That's, you're really asking for a concept, not hard, fast drawings, and that's kind of how I would propose, and yes, we can take the plans we have and what Archipelago has, and we can put together something that actually works and we can show you some different things. Uh, yes, that's what I do. One. So <laughs> this is referral to produce, yes. So would you please read the motion? To refer the proposal by Archipelago Investments and the Str Spring Street Northside Parking from Boltwood Avenue to Churchill Street to the Community Resources Committee with a report to the council with updated drawings on October 21. Can we just add in the word conceptual, conceptual. drawings? 
Thank you. Steve. Um, October 21 seems a tiny bit ambitious, and I know that the report can be that we're still working on it, but I wonder if we should have a more realistic, just because the CRC itself meets two more times. I, right, yeah. and you won't be meeting during... Because there's a holiday the in holidays, there. holidays, yeah, yeah. right. So maybe um, by before the end of the year, or... As long as it's not holding up their permit. Lynn? And I'm hearing that it's not. Lynn? Yes. Yeah. I don't see why CRC can't have an additional meeting. I think that we're not meeting enough and we need to get going. We have a lot on our plate. So it might be that you, we, we certainly can say November sometime and consistent with our meeting schedule. So it would be, here we get into it. We meet on October 7th. We meet on October 21st. We are holding October 28th as a tentative. We are not meeting again then until November 18th because of the combination of elections and Veterans Day, and Veterans Day exactly. So November 18th? I, I'd be okay with that. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, we could move as quickly as is uh, appropriate. And also, this work is going to be some of the very last work that happens on the project. So mm -hmm. from a construction standpoint, there's, there's time before uh, decisions are made on procuring whatever needed to procure to, to do that. And but for a concept plan, we could have that by the end of this week, if needed. Okay. And if, if it comes back to the council earlier, that's perfectly fine. That's fine. I can always move it up on the agenda. Uh, Alyssa. I just wanted to say quickly that since I know we have so many experts of various types at the table, I want something that looks something like that, but with something in front of it, I want it to show a resemblance of the building and some, some concepts in front of it, not things like our delightful drawings here that are greatly detailed but are not going to help me figure that out. So okay. thank it, you for, it, it, it doesn't have to be fancy, but it does have to show a real building and, a, and an okay. idea in front of it. To, and tell your and, bikers to wear helmets. Um, <laughs> okay, so, yes, Pat. Question, um, yeah. uh, uh, trash pickup and all of that, is that going to go around the side of the building or are you going to be on the street picking that up? Uh, yeah, that's... Because that blocks half the street Yeah, easily. we discussed all that in planning board and it's in the building. It's in, the trash storage is in the building for pickup. And, and that was settled with the planning board, which is where it is appropriate. So we have a motion before us. Are there any other comments? You want to try reading that emotion again, sure. Dana? <laughs> to refer the proposal by Archipelago Investments and the St Spring Street Northside parking from Boltwood Avenue to Churchill Street to the Community Resources Committee with a report to the Council with updated conceptual drawings on November 18, 2019. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Are there any further conversations? Then all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. I believe it was 13 4, none against, and none abstain. We thank you for working with us. Thank and you for again, working with us. for helping to educate us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just thought there was no point in CRC talking about it if we didn't have a little more to go. I agree. I just going in circles. Right. Um, okay. Our next item is regarding the school bus. And... Um, I think, Sonia, you're... You're doing the school bus. Is this on? Sonia Aldrich, Comptroller, and I'm here stepping in some very big shoes for Sean Mangano to explain the school bus the best I can. Okay. And so the proposal, if we could briefly review it, is to. Um, put together some uh, it, funds that already exist and aggregate them. They've already been appropriated for something. We can aggregate them and then spend them. Correct, we have um, 
repurpose capital for this bus. Thank it you. became an urgent issue when one of the when the backup bus engine blew and it was going to cost thirty thousand dollars to replace an engine in an almost ten year old bus. So um, the facilities director went to the finance director, Sean Mangano, and asked if there was any way that he could use some of this capital that's used for maintenance of the bus and um, for repairs of the bus and some other vehicles, if he could use some of that to buy a new bus rather than to try to do repairs to an old bus. So they would move the new bus into the rotation and one of the older buses would come down to as a um, spare. Okay. And we do have old capital. It's still capital that would have been used. It would have been used to pay the $30,000 to have the bus fixed and everything. We are just repurposing this. And I just, um, we could have used, we could have bought the bus and just paid the capital with the existing lines because it falls within the purview of a lot of the um, articles there. We brought it to, we wanted to bring it to the council because it's such a large um, purchase that we wanted to be as transparent as possible. So we had the funding to buy the bus. We just wanted to put it all in one article and do it this way. And it's off cycle with the normal budget it's process. It's very on, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the question and the motion before us, if you will, is um, to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20-25 in order appropriating funds for a new school for new school bus as recommended by the Finance Committee report dated September 6, 2019. I'm not going to ask for the motion yet, but I am going to ask Andy to report on the Finance Committee. The well, Finance Committee um, report was very brief, as you note, uh, because I think that we were principally looking at the question of what funds are available and uh, what would be the consequence of uh, spending, uh, of acquiring more funds for the purchase. Um, as you note on the listing, there's essentially $91,518 that is available, as uh, Sonia has uh, indicated, by uh, repurposing previously appropriated unspent funds. Um, if we were to go to um, a more expensive bus, such as an electric bus, um, then we would uh, be in a um, requirement that we allocate additional funds from some source and um, it does um, increase the capital expenditure for this particular item. If it was to come out of um, FY21 capital purchase requests, it would essentially be in competition with um, our continuing effort to do something about roads and sidewalks. So that's just something that uh, to bear in mind. I think the only other thing that I'll add right now, and then I'll um, only I'll add more if there's questions that need response. But um, the question came up about diesel, and the, uh, Mr. Mangano had indicated that the um, anticipation was that um, it would be a gasoline bus, not a diesel bus. OK. And the estimated cost of that, di of that gas bus is $90,000. Correct. Okay. Is there any other information at this point? Um, the, did, did you hand out that? Yes. There was a, a new uh, memo that um, Sean Mangano and Rupert put together today that had some comparisons, prices, of what an electric bus would cost versus the gasoline or the diesel buses. Also, um, there was questions about hybrids, and they've gone to a couple of different vendors to see if there are hybrids available in this area for that, and there are none at, the t at this time. Uh, everybody's um, concentrating on electric buses right now. We also checked the state bid list to see if there was anything out there for Massachusetts, and there was electric and gasoline and diesel. There were no hybrids on that. 
And this memo also addresses the availability of grant funds and other considerations. Right. Um, everyone that works for the town is very good at looking, looking for grants and other ways to, to um, pay for these things. This is an urgent purchase. That's why we're doing it out of old capital. The need is really, is they want, tried, wanted to try to get this going as soon as possible because it takes time to get the bus out there, so. Okay. Other, yes, Evan. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on a couple of things. So first of all, is my understanding from what you said that because this is just repurposing existing funds, you actually didn't need council approval for this, but decided to come to the council anyway? Oh, maybe I shouldn't even have brought that up. But yeah, old capital, the way capital is, is voted for, uh, for the town and has been for many years is in a, one article for capital. So as long as you've got the list of all those items that were voted in that year, you can, if, if one project costs less, but another project went over, it's, it's, pract it's um, acceptable practice to use what's in one line item to cover the item that went over. So in theory, this isn't necessary. It's a step that you all chose to do. Yeah, we chose to. And so then my understanding is if we chose to go for a bus such as one of these listed here that is above 91,000, that would be a new appropriation because it goes beyond and then it would trigger 5.6. Is that correct? Yes. 5.6 of the charter. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's correct. And this, at, regarding what we are looking at now, we're not triggering that. Okay. So, Darcy. Are we having general discussion now? Yes. Um, I think that you all saw the, the sample motion that I passed out. Um, I uh, watched the finance, the joint finance JCPC meeting and um, felt that the, basically that there wasn't enough time at the meeting on Friday to really get deeply into some of these questions. Um, the committee only had an hour for the actual finance committee part of the meeting. And um, as you can see on this list that I handed out, um, I have 15 questions that go to the cost comparison between electric vehicles and um, gas-powered vehicles. And um, I think that it's really important for the finance committee to look at um, how we could potentially save money by purchasing an electric vehicle, which um, is pretty clear if you look at the data that over the long run, the fact that um, electric vehicles um, don't use gas, uh, you say you have a huge, huge savings on the fact that you don't use gas, and the other savings is the fact that you do not have very much maintenance at all. And uh, for those of us who own electric vehicles, uh, we really get that because, you know, I've had an electric vehicle for five years, no maintenance. You don't have to tune it up. You don't know oil changes. You don't have to replace all those parts that, that you need to do in an internal um, combustion engine vehicle. And it makes a massive difference difference. Um, obviously, it's, it's a, a big stretch to come up with um, this amount of money uh, up front for a bus, but I think it's really incumbent upon s someone. It seemed to me the Finance Committee to send it back to the Finance Committee to reconsider all of these different issues because it is actually really clear that over the long run you save money with an electric vehicle. Um, so all of these um, different questions I think really need to be answered and um, I did struggle with who should answer them or where it should be referred to. My, my first thought was that it should be referred 
to the ECAC because it's in the ECAC's charge. And I think at least in the future, we should think about sending these kinds of issues to the ECAC. I'm not completely sure that it's ready right now to be able to handle individual substantive issues because we're working on goals and um, our outreach in coming back to the council with those goals. Um, but uh, I think that we need to keep in mind that we have the 100% renewable resolution. We are transitioning to a more sustainable town. We're in all ways moving from fossil fuels to clean energy, electrifying all of our different sectors. And we have to figure out when is going to be the cutoff time? When are we going to stop having one-offs? When are we actually going to be making a commitment to um, moving forward with making all of our purchases, all our procurement, everything that we're doing in transportation buildings across the board, sustainable? So um, I'm interested in hearing from other people um, uh, if you agree that these are questions that are really valuable to answer, does it make sense to refer it to the, back to the Finance Committee? Should we be referring it somewhere else? Um, and um, yeah, I'm interested in finding out what you think about this. I understand that there's a time, a time question, and I think that that's something that we could try to get the answers for Quickly. Dorothy. Um, what is concerning me is not whether an electric bus is better for the environment or for the students in terms of pollution, nor the cost of running and, and uh, it, it, the bus. I'm very worried about what's written at the bottom of the sheet here. Um, I think that we do want to have electric buses, but it sounds to me that the electric school buses right now lack some things that we need. So I think we should be moving forward to buying an electric bus in the future, but I think that's, it has to be better because it says it doesn't have enough range to be used on field trips or for athletic trips. And because of that, it can't, it can only be used for certain things and it would eliminate the needed resiliency that redundant buses provide. So you would think you maybe we'd have to buy an electric bus and a gas engine bus um, because right now, according to this, the electric bus cannot meet some of the needs that the school has. And I know from, you know, I'm driving a hybrid now, I know that the car science is getting much, much better. It sounds, seems to me that electric school buses aren't quite there yet. I want to get to some other questions. Chalene? You had your hand up. I did, but I was wondering if Darcy wanted to respond to that, and then I can come in with the next question. Okay. Are there other questions along this line? Darcy? We already, uh, the majority of our school buses are now gas-powered. So if we have field trips, we can use the gas-powered buses. If there's a need to have a longer range, I think the day-to-day -day range is not going to exceed 70 or 80 miles on a, on a regular day of school bus driving. But what they're stating here is it means that if some of the gas buses need to be repaired, they can't necessarily put the electric bus in to replace them for some things. That, so it, it would seem to me that we could be buying a new gas bus and a new electric bus. Are there additional comments? Chalini? Um I feel like it would be, um, if there's a way to anticipate, you know, all the buildings and vehicles and all the other areas that the ECAC committee could look, start looking so that it's not when we're in emergency that we start you know, asking these questions, but could we identify the grants or like have that committee really start looking at it in a very serious way 
that what are the options we have across the board for buildings and vehicles and schools, libraries, what, you know, what are some grants out there and what are best practices for that? So are you saying not for this, but in the long run? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there additional comments? Yes, George. Darcy raises, I think, important questions, but these are difficult questions. I don't believe they can be answered that quickly. Meantime, we need a bus. We have the money for the bus. Um, and there is the issue of range. So I th hope that these questions will be addressed and perhaps in the long term we can come up with a, a plan that will begin to move us in the right direction. But right now we need a bus and we have the money for the bus. And um, the questions that Darcy's, Darcy is raising cannot, I think, be answered in, in the short time that, that we have. So I would think that this is something we should go ahead and do. Okay. Are there other, yes. Alyssa. I think it's entirely appropriate for following up on what Shalini said with ECAC to look at the upcoming capital plan and say, oh, this is the next time we're doing a bus? Well, maybe not this one, but this one's definitely going to be electric, and this thing will be electric, and that should be part of the capital planning process, and we should start now in terms of, like, where do we draw that line in terms of that question. But with this emergency and with it potentially costing three times more at this time, then the emergency bus that seems like it would serve all the needs that we need it to serve for right now. The line's not yet, but I would argue for the upcoming capital plan, it should be. It should be clearly laid out in the upcoming capital plan when it is that we are going to start doing this as a serious investment on a regular basis, even though it costs more up front because of the payback costs, but on an emergency basis. And I, and I don't want us to get into another emergency, which is why I'm saying plan it into mm -hmm. The next capital plan, emergencies always arise, but at least start planning it in. Okay. Additional comments at this time? Yes. Mandy Jo. Um, I don't know whether Darcy's going to make her motion or not. If she did, I would support it. Um, we need to start figuring out when it's worth spending the extra capital to save on the operational costs. And right now, yes, three times as much sounds crazy. But if over the course of 16 or 20 years or however long that bus is gonna last, it's gonna save us another 200 or 300,000, then it's not so crazy. And to not ask for the information to figure out whether it would be why a wise spending of our money now to save over 20 years, a certain amount of money. Um, why, why wouldn't we just say, why don't we want that? In, I think we want that information. Which way is it more logical to spend our money? You know, that's, that's what the 100% um, renewable um, zero energy, you know, the zero energy bylaw is saying with capital buildings, when we build a big building, spend the money now to save the operating over the course of the life of the building. This is that in smaller terms. Yet we don't know whether it would save it. Darcy seems to think it would. I, I don't know. I think it, a lot depends on the price of gas and the price of electric. Um, but the maintenance certainly does get saved. But we don't know how much it would save. And so we can't make an um, educated decision without the information. So I think whether or not she makes the motion, whether or not that motion may or may not succeed, I think our finance committee in the future when they're looking at this it, stuff like this where it is, shouldn't ask for just the purchase price difference. Needs to ask for the operational cost difference too. And so I urge, no matter what happens with what Darcy wants, our finance committee to going forward always seek the operational cost differences also so that we can have the information to make an educated choice. Are there additional comments? Yes, Evan. So I have two questions and potentially a comment based on the answer to the second question. First question is following up a little bit on what Mandy Jo said. I don't know what the average lifespan of a school bus is. This one that we're looking to replace, it says is approximately 10 years old. We're not going to get that answer tonight. Yeah, I don't either. But most vehicles are like five to 10 years. So I don't know if it's different with an electric bus. I haven't done the research. I believe electric is 15. Again, we're not going to get definitive right. answers to these questions tonight, and I do not want 
to spend the council's time on that. Either we go ahead with this bus or we go ahead with a different motion and get more information. Evan. So I guess my second question being uh, that we have $91.5,000 available and the lowest estimate on this sheet is 325, that leaves about $230,000. Um, if the Finance Committee came back and said that they did want an electric bus, um, that would have to be an additional appropriation. Would that come from free cash stabilization fund? Yes. And so I think that's, so here's my comment then. So that's, I think my concern is, I, you know, so in January we took 212,000 out of stabilization for Station Road Bridge. Uh, we're possibly about to take another 300,000 out for Hickory Ridge. Um, and then if we were to take another 230 out potentially for this, these are pretty significant draws from our stabilization fund at a time when I think we're looking to sort of maintain it as we go into these major capital projects. And so I think I support the idea of having a plan to start transitioning our fleet off of fossil fuels, but I think the key word that some people have brought up has been a, a plan and it built into a capital plan and built into something going forward, I would be really worried about having this have to pull from stabilization instead of looking at it and part in a larger context of our, of our capital purchases um, in the future. And so I agree with Mandy Joe. I think these questions need to be answered. I don't think they need to be answered right now because I don't think that the answers should necessarily affect the purchase of this vehicle given the time constraints and given our current funding ability. But I do think that ECAC working with finance, working with capital, should be a part of this conversation going forward to figure out how we can do this won't, so we can actually plan for the funding. But I'd really hate to see us pull you know, $800,000 out of stabilization just this year for some of these things that keep popping up. Mr. Brockman. Thank you. So the only reason this request is before you is because it's an emergency. If the bus that they had been using had not failed, this would have gone through the normal capital process and the, you know, the department would have presented, JCP, PC would have engaged in the conversation. And there is a, a plan of action you know, on, the, you know, the, on the vehicle replacement program that we have. So the only reason it's before you is because the school department determined that they had a bus that was taken out of service. It was going to cost $30,000 to repair. It seemed to make more sense to them to spend seventy-five, dollars $90,000 to get a new bus versus repair the bus. So I think that that's, that's the logic of this and why it's, why it's a standalone thing. Um, it's because it's, they feel that they need a new bus before they get into the winter season for resiliency or redundancy. Okay. Darcy. Uh, I just wanted to, to answer Evan in the, uh, just saying that we don't have to necessarily take the funds from the stabilization fund. One of the questions here on the list is, about um, looking into to grant funding, and I know that you have looked at that somewhat, but one thing I haven't heard about is the uh, VW settlement funds that are available in Massachusetts through Maura Healy's office. Um, there is supposed to be $75 million specifically set aside for electric vehicle, um, electric vehicles, and she wants to transition all electric vehicles, including buses, um, to electric by 2030. So um, we, that's one of the things that I would like to be looked at um, by the Finance Committee, and I would like to make a motion. All right. Please go ahead and make your motion. <laughs> Uh, I move to refer the matter of the purchase of the school bus back to the Finance Committee for reconsideration so that it may obtain the answers to additional questions about the cost comparison between the purchase of a gas or diesel powered school bus and electric school bus and other relevant questions including, but not limited to, do I need to read no. all of them? No, um, you do so not. So we all, we all have the list here. So there are 15 questions. So the motion's been made. Is there a second? second? Okay. Any further discussion on this particular motion? Let me just say that this motion puts many of us in an awkward position. I'll speak for myself. 
It's not that I don't think we should answer these questions. I just don't think we can answer them in time to resolve this problem at this time. I definitely want to see these questions answered. I don't even know how many school buses we own. I know we rent buses. I've never studied the school bus situation for the town of Amherst and the regional school district. And this requires a whole lot more information. In addition to that, having spent close to 50 years of my life in a grant and contract world, they don't show up fast. They may not have the funding cycle right now. They may not award for another six months to a year. This is something where we need a bus now. So I totally support getting the answers to all these questions, but I personally cannot support your motion. I'm just reading an article written by Scott, actually, about an electric bus that we bought in Amherst, and it does have a, a number for the savings, so maybe we can answer one of the questions. I now. don't want to get into trying to answer the questions okay. tonight at the council. Okay, but just if anyone's curious, it's $96,000 and 14000 reduction in repairs. So we're still, you know, uh, over, and this is over a decade the savings would be, so just if anyone was curious. Um, but I, I still do agree that we do have an emergency and we have not planned for this huge expenditure. So we, as a, as a council, we are very committed and would, should be planning and thinking about it. It's, but an, not it's an issue not just for ECAC, but for Finance Committee and for JCPC where most of those large capital uh, expenditures on equipment actually are discussed in full. Are there other conversations about this particular motion? Kathy. Um, I don't know enough, I don't understand enough about how we amend motions. If you uh, agree in concept that we should be thinking this way, I mean, my preference would be this one goes because it's coming to us as an emergency and we have the money, but that no other bus should come to us this way without this type of analysis. And I would like to see, I mean, Darcy's got a list here, but mine is it, if we need a mix, a fleet with a mix, do we need three electrics and five? It's, he said, I don't know how many buses we have. Which, what's the mix look like? So it's not just what next year's bus might be in the capital plan, but I'd like a five or 10 year plan if we can rent a bus, can we, someone, Lynn, you just threw up, we can rent a bus, then we don't have to buy a bus right now. So I, I, I voted on this in finance because it seemed like a really good idea, but now I'm, the extent to which I don't have information is quite large. If this one can be purchased and there's one available to buy, and I'm looking at price tags that actually say $75,000 for a gasoline bus, so could we buy it cheaper? than 91. I mean, it, it feels like we're in this, we have some information, it's an emergency, and can we make a referral back be the next bus has to come in with this kind of information and we need a plan rather than each time, because there will be another emergency otherwise, we'll, we'll do this same thing again. Um, so I, I don't see quite how out of the concept that we want this information, and we would prefer not making this decision without it, without a, um, with, with us hearing the kids won't have a bus to get on. Um, and we can't get a grant, I know, that quickly. So that's where, I don't know how to amend it to have this not fall on the floor, but have this be an action plan. I would suggest that we not try to mix the two motions. That if you want a motion to buy the bus, we buy the bus. If you want a motion that questions like this in the future be answered for capital plans, that's a separate motion. And is, do I say, and for emergencies, we want these questions, because if it, this, yeah, is the, this is the issue that's right. coming up. This didn't come to us this way. I think way. the question, we have a motion on the floor that would refer this back to CRC with, I mean, I'm sorry, finance, with a number of questions and the option of adding even more 
it says, including but not limited to, more questions that would lead to then a purchase of a bus at some point when all of these questions have been satisfactorily answered. We can either approve this motion and move on, or we can defeat the motion and go back to the original purchase motion, and then come back to this and do something that says, as you go forward, ECAC, and as you go forward, finance, and as you go forward, um, JCPC, these are the kinds of in pieces of information we want to make sure you have when we make capital decisions. Yes, Darcy. Um, and I also think we need to think about, like, each time the town comes to us with a request to um, pr purchase something that's powered by fossil fuels on an emergency basis, whether it's a boiler or uh, whatever it is, that we want to have a cutoff time where from that time on, we are going to be transitioning to non-fossil fuel. Again. So, that, so that, that, that we're not going to have one off after one off after one off after one off that are urgent. These, I, I hear you and I think there's some merit to that. I'm not sure we can always adhere to it, but I don't want to mix the two items. Right now, we have before us whether we refer this bus purchase back to CRC to answer all of these questions. Finance. I mean, finance. I'm sorry, to answer all of these questions or... <laughs> good. Or we go forward, we defeat this, and then go back to whether we purchase the bus. So I'm going to call the question. The question is on the motion. I move to refer the matter of purchase of a school bus back to the Finance Committee for reconsideration so that it may obtain the answers to additional questions about the cost comparison between the purchase of a gas or diesel powered school bus and an electric school bus and other relevant questions including but not limited to the 15 or so questions listed here. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? We're, we're down one, counselor. Okay, did you get all the eyes? And the final vote is? Three in favor, eight against, and one abstention. Okay, all right, so let's go back to the original motion that was on the sheet, which I thought you all downloaded, but I guess not. And that is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY. 20-25, and order appropriating funds for new school bus, as recommended by the Finance Committee report dated September 6, 2019. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Any further discussion at this time? I move to postpone. I think she's using her right to postpone okay. under the charter. in hopes that the Finance Committee will still look at those questions. No, it, you cannot, you can move to postpone, but you can't put conditions on the postponement. Yes, Mr. Bachman. I think we need to look at Robert's Rules of Orders because there's a motion made and seconded, and yes. I'm not sure if that, has, that action has to occur before the right to postpone. I think we, if you could take a recess so we could examine that. Thank you. Let's take a recess anyway. All right, are we ready to reconvene? We're missing one, but I think she she's on her way. Okay, hi, Alyssa. <laughs> uh, we're ready to reconvene. Okay, according to section 
10.10c. In fact, this all discussion ceases and this will be referred to the next meeting of the town council. We are meeting as a town council on September 17th at six o'clock p.m. We're meeting jointly with the school committee. I will be posting a meeting for 5.30 that night for consideration of this question. Otherwise, it would be referred back to our retreat or not until the 23rd. Okay. There's no further discussion or debate at this time based on the action. Okay. Moving on, we're going to look at the town manager contract. You've received this and then there was a slight need for adjustments to make sure all the dates coincided. So you received a second option. This is the option you looked at in executive session. It has since been reviewed by the town attorney, human resources, Paul Bockelman, myself, and Mandy Johanneke. So all the council has seen it, albeit it was for a short time. It is very consistent with the previous contract and has got pretty much the standard stuff that's in it. So are there questions at this time? Yes, Alyssa. Beyond the fact that we apparently have no public who are interested in speaking to this issue, I feel that it's necessary for the president to give a one or two sentence description of how we got to this point because otherwise it looks pro forma that we're just voting in public. Thank and you. so a little bit about more about the contract or about the fact that we had exec session. That Thank you. So as many people know, we have had an extensive calendar that began way back in June asking for public input, input from staff, and then required input from every one of the 13 town councilors. All of that was completed at various deadlines throughout the summer, uh, and the town councilors provided me with all of their comments by August 6th. And on August 6th, I began compiling the draft that you saw of the review of the town manager's evaluation. The final copy of that is in your packet and has now been posted to the website regarding the town manager's evaluation. That, re that document was reviewed once on August 19th and again on August 26th. Based on that, at the night of August 26th, the town council went into executive session and discussed among ourselves the compensation package as well as the renewal of contract with the town manager. We then concluded the evening and did not come back into public session. This is the first time we have been back in public session. So what we did do, however, was look at a variety of information regarding comparables. We looked at the draft of a contract. We looked at the previous contract. And we settled on the following main features in this new contract. One is to extend the contract until October until August 31st, 2023. The second was to offer Mr. Balkman a uh, cost of living of 2% plus a 3% based on performance. All the rest of the conditions of the contract remain the same as they have been, which include a car allowance, an allowance for cell phone, and a payment towards his individually held um, disability policy. Basically, the contract you therefore have before you was taken out of that executive session and, the, and completed and then went through these various reviews, including the town attorney, the um, human resource director, Mr. Bockelman, myself, and Mandy Johanneke. 
Are there questions? Yes. I just have a few questions about benefits. I don't always understand what's written. Yes. Um, so on vacation days, it says it can be up to 50 days, which is like two years at the end of any calendar year. Does that mean that when he retires or takes another job, he can get paid for 50 vacation days that he didn't use but no more? That is correct. Okay. And that is, by the way, consistent with the personnel policy of the town. Okay. And then on, I don't understand what it means, sick, sick leave accrues without limit and there's no buyback of unused sick time. I don't, In other words, who buys it back? When you retire, you cannot cash in your sick leave. That's All right. different than, uh, for instance, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has had the practice of getting 20% of your sick leave, but they've actually rethought that policy and capped that. And then the last thing, just thinking of, of different places that I've worked, there's, um, and I don't know the right words, sometimes there's um, a fund which um, the institute has where some of the pay is put in a, a tax deferred account of some sort. That, there's nothing like that in this one. Okay. There is no tax deferred annuity in this. I, in studying what other towns have done, they do actually offer some tax deferred annuity options. At this point, that has not been the practice of the town of Amherst. And although we discussed it briefly during preliminary conversations with uh, the town manager, that is not a direction that we've gone at this time. He, uh, uh, he however, can still do his own tax deferred. Right. Well, sometimes there's even a small match, so. Yes. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Kathy. Um, I just make it clear, at least my understanding is when you went through the decisions we made that the increase in terms of wages was just this, <coughs> the current year increase, that it is not going to be that for each of the four years. That is correct. We, we come back to each year at, each. at the beginning again. By, by virtue of the charter and practice of the town, we evaluate the town manager annually, and based on that, we set his compensation annually. And then I had a question, um, and I, I will admit, I usually read contracts really carefully, but I was pretty tired when we were looking at this uh, at the last meeting. So on... <laughs> given the time, and I was more focused on the pay side of it than all the clauses. Uh, the, the arrangement for severance here, it goes up, you know, this is not for cause, uh, that would just end it. But if, um, as is highly unlikely, Paul just doesn't have the kind of energy that he's got right now. But some other reason, we do nine months in year one, 10 in year two, 11 in year three, and 12 in year four. Are there other town manager contracts that go out four years? I mean, is this a, it, it's, it's a pretty generous, I'm not talking about year one or year two, but it's pretty generous toward the end of this that you get a full year after we decide it's not working. And I just had a question of comparables for the, the length of the contract, not the, not the beginning of, not the first couple of years. We actually started this count counting going up from where the previous contract was. So the previous contract started at nine months, or actually started at nine, eight, seven months probably. And then I'd have to look at the previous contract to make sure it was six or seven. And then we maxed it at 12, this contract. My personal experience is that this is normal, and the research that we looked at from other towns and our consultation with our attorney that this is normal. It's also normal to cap it at 12. As I said, I don't know. I mean, I know corporate, there are a lot of golden pallet parachutes. Yes. Um, you know, in terms of that they can be extraordinarily generous, but this, this, is, a, this is a generous policy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there other questions? Go 
Dorothy. Pension is somewhere else. Uh, Paul is automatically part of the state, or the, it's, it's the town pension system, but it is identical to the state. And I've not asked Paul how many years he has in that. He's shaking his head like maybe not enough. <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> As you know, the state pension, very much like that of New York in Massachusetts, years and years of service and age are the golden combination. Mm -hmm. So you get to 80% and then you can't get any more. So. Okay, any other questions? None? So the motion that I would like someone to make is that in accordance with the Amherst Home Rural Charter and Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 108N, the Town Council enter into an employment agreement with Paul Bachman to serve as town manager for a four-year term commencing August 22nd, 2019. Is there a motion? Dorothy. I so move. Second. Second. Pat. Any further discussion or questions? Any public comment? <laughs> Hearing none, then we're going to move the question. And so all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? No, or absent, A abstain, I'm sorry, abstain. And we have one absent. So I've, we've made three copies of this. There's a line on which we would like each of you to sign since I didn't want to do this myself and we'll pass it around. Okay, so um, why don't we start over with Alyssa and we'll fill in the dates and so forth as we go along. Okay, policy on the publication of candidate statements. Yes, Alyssa. When, when the final version is signed, actually, I would prefer it not to be, fine, give me whatever, but when we're finished with this, we should put a readable PDF, not an image of a PDF, up on the website that shows it was, and just write that it was signed on such and such date, because otherwise we tend to put things in the scanner and then, you know, they're just pictures. They're not searchable. And we should go ahead and put up the searchable thing on our town manager evaluation yes. website. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're going to, while we're each signing, um, we're going to move on to the policy on publication of candidate statements. And this is an, it, a recommendation coming out of GOL. So Mandy Joe. So can we get the slide show? Thank you, Athena. Um, while she's pulling that up, we were tasked with coming up with a policy to conform with the charter section 7.6 that requires Quote, the town council shall establish a process compliant with state campaign and political finance laws for candidates whose names will appear on the election ballot to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin board, end quote. Uh, the council referred this to us on July 1. We are back with a draft policy for your consideration. The expectation is that we won't vote on this till our next regular meeting on September 23rd. GOL has actually not voted on this proposed policy yet. We've had a couple meetings with very few people and we were pushing it out to get it out for our first reading here um, for review and comments and all by now um, so that we could vote by September 23rd. So that's why we haven't formally made a recommendation to you. But um, we came up with something that was included in your packet. It does a couple things. One, it defines what a candidate statement would be. And that would include essentially three things on the website. On the town website would be the candidate's name, 
one URL that the candidate supplies hyperlinking, oh, let one hyperlink to some sort of URL that the candidate supplies to a web page that is not the town web page. I guess they could supply one that is on the town web page, but um, that they would supply that and that would be attached, the hyperlink would be their name. Um, and then a statement that is text only, that is no longer than 900 characters, and those characters would include the spaces too. Um, so that's how we defined candidate statement. Um, we identified what offices this would apply to, and we chose only local offices. So town council, school committee, board of library trustees, housing authority, and the Oliver Smith will elector. It would not include offices for state or federal office and our election. Um, the next slide is we create a timeline for submitting and publishing this. Um, we would request that the town IT set up an actual online form for submitting the statements, and so that's what this policy envisions. Um, we would allow paper submissions if an individual requests a paper form. So it would not have to be submitted online, um, but that would certainly be the preferred method. Um, late submissions would still be published within five days of being submitted. Um, we have a deadline for submitting initially, and that is so that then most of them or whoever submitted by that deadline will all be published at the same time, and so there won't be piecemeal unless you miss that deadline, but missing that deadline does not prohibit you from having a statement published. Um, we decided how the name order, where we're proposing how the names would be listed on the website, and, and we are proposing essentially ballot order, so by office, starting with town council, um, and then however the offices are listed on the ballot, and then from there, how the names will be listed on the ballot. Um, that means the timeline we're proposing has that the website does not get initially published until after name order is drawn by the Board of Registrars and Clerk's Office, and, and that still allows approximately a month, um, and I'll show you that on the next slide, but we've got one more, required disclaimer. We will have a disclaimer on the website. We envision working with IT and the town clerk to see how that would look, but the goal is to have it shown anywhere and everywhere candidate statements are published. This web page could be potentially very long. As you scroll, you still want to see that disclaimer. Um, and we put in the language then maximum visibility. And so then here's a proposed, this is what the timeline for this year would look like. We recognize that this isn't quite allowable since we're seeking a vote on the 23rd. And one of the dates is before the 23rd. So our motion would include um, fixing that if we vote on the 23rd. So no nomination papers need filed by September 17th. Um, so the town clerk would then email the URL for the online form on how you would submit it on the 18th to all candidates, all individuals who submitted and filed, filed papers, not just took out papers, but they had to file them, which means they get a URL before they're determined to have, potentially determined to have filed enough signatures. Um, the deadline for withdrawing or filing objections to signatures is October 3rd. The deadline to submit the form to the town to be on the first published day is October 3rd at 5 p.m. The town clerk would draw the names for the ballot on October 4th, and the candidate submit statements that were submitted by October 3rd at 5 p.m. would go live on October 8th at 5 p.m. Um, and I put the last day to register. And then candidate sub statements submitted after October 3rd at 5 p.m. would be added to the bulletin board within five days of being business days of being submitted. So that's a proposed timeline. Only candidates whose names are on the ballot are included. That is a charter. And so we stuck with the charter. We did not expand out from the charter on that. And th the reason we picked a deadline for publishing or going live after withdrawal or filing means that hopefully you know, the IT department or clerk's office isn't gonna have to remove names from what's been published, um, that all the certified signatures will be there, we're gonna know who's on the ballot, and all of that so that when it goes live, 
we're not missing names, but we're also not including names that won't show up on the ballot. Um, one of the goals was to have minimal extra work for town staff, so not to potentially have to have them revisiting a whole bunch of times, redoing stuff, reordering stuff. Um, that's why we chose an online form. Hopefully then it's easy to cut and paste and everything. So that's the basics, basics of this policy that we are putting forth to you for discussion. But not vote, voting tonight. I mean, I guess you could. We're not going to stop you, but our rules of procedure in the council generally recommend that we put it forth one uh, night yeah. and vote the next. So, so it'll come forth again on the 23rd. Yeah. Okay. Uh, council discussion at this time. Yes, Kath. Um, um, Kathy? Yeah. Yeah, uh, my question, I have a question on how you came up with 900 characters, including <laughs> spaces. Um, I, I have been subjected to characters before, 900 characters. I've seen sort of 1,000, which ranges from 175 words to 250. So the question is, um, that's a tough thing for people to even understand how to get there. They can understand words. so. Was there a rationale why not 250 words or 150 words or something in that? And is this a space issue on our website um, in terms of how much spatial area? So those are my questions on where this came from because my understanding of characters is also matters whether I'm using a font type of 10, 11, 12 in terms of the amount of space it takes on a line. So where did 900 come from? So, Mandy Jo, please. So 900 came from, it's about the equivalent of 150 words. Um, and the town's form database and how you create a form by the, on the town's website cannot limit a submission to number of words, but it can limit a submission to the number of characters. And so uh, to attempt to um, mitigate people submitting statements that are longer than the policy allows that would then require cutting, we're hoping to essentially stop that from happening by if you submit online, you're not gonna actually be able to hit the submit button if your statement is too long. But we had to go to character count instead of word count to do that on the town webpage. So that's why we chose characters over words. But it is approximately equivalent to 150 words and that is approximately where the town attorney said is a standard length for this type of statement. It's about where the League of Women Voters is for their statements. It's about where Gazette was for some of their statements. So it's, it's in the standard realm of things that are done for this. Alyssa. It's actually a lot more words than the League of Women Voters normally provided over many decades. And so they looked at things differently for the first town council race. But I appreciate the concept of it being difficult, but the reality is that is the way our software works. If you've ever posted a meeting, you get a thousand characters. After that, you have to abbreviate. That's why you see crazy abbreviations in meeting postings sometimes, because there's literally a limit and it'll tell you, nope, you've gone too far. Mm -hmm. um, and so I appreciate that. I, I, I'm not sure why the statement was made that we're not going to include things like state rep, state senator, and Amherst Democratic Town Committee, because like, I know you didn't mention that one specifically. This is the Amherst Home Rule Charter. This has nothing to do with, I can't believe that it was ever intended, and if it was, that was a really bizarre idea that we would suddenly start including state senate and state uh, rep braces in this. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with this whole concept. I'm not thrilled about doing it, but I understand the charter says we can do it and we should find a way to do it. Um, I wanna make sure that when we're talking about distributing a policy, it, I think we need a more user-friendly version of the policy that needs to be distributed when people pull papers. And I also believe that after maybe this first time it'll be different because of, of the timing, but that after that we should in fact not wait until people submit papers to give them the URL. When people pull papers, they can be looking at the user-friendly version of the policy and thinking about what they want to write, and they should be able to submit it the next day, even if they haven't turned in the papers, because it's not going to get published. So that gives people more time 
to think about it, and there's literally no reason to make them wait until they turn papers in. It's not like there's 80 million more people who pull papers than actually submit papers. So I think we should give people that option just because I know we all remember when we were running, this was the most number of survey type things we'd ever had to fill out before. And being able to space that out over time and also for people to think about over the course of the time that they're getting their signatures would be useful. I also think it shouldn't be a problem if they wanna submit more than once. The software ought to be able to handle additional submissions and just take the most recent one. I'm confident our people could figure that out. So if they want to edit it, they just submit a new one. They submit a new one, I see. And yes, Dorothy? Well, when I looked at this today, I, I thought it was brilliant, the idea of uh, having a URL, but I do have a legal question. I mean, um, this keeps the town from supporting or allowing whatever some candidate might want to put on their hyperlink. But on the other hand, is the town really held safe if somebody put a really weird stuff in the URL? Mandy Joe? So they would be able to submit any URL they want. That is why there is a disclaimer on the town website portion of this candidate statement. We, um, my understanding is that we really can't regulate what they write due to free speech. So that's why the disclaimer is meant for maximum visibility. Mm -hmm. Paul might be able to talk a little bit more about speech issues. So, so sometimes what, I'm not sure if we can actually do this, um, they put in what they call an interstitial page. So when you click on the link, it takes you to a page that says you are leaving the town of Amherst website to uh, base, and then you're someplace else, so that there's no expectation you can hit back to get, uh, I mean, you might be able to get back, but it, it's very clear that you're leaving the town of Amherst website. So in case someone puts some a really bizarre website for whatever reason, um, it protects the town that way. But, but my question is more, what if that website actually goes to something that's obscene and on the borderline of illegal? I mean, I, I'm sorry, that's, that's the, my biggest concern about the link to anything. Can, and we can't state anything on our policy about that link to that URL? Well, that's up to you to decide how you want, if you want, ed, want to have editing privileges over what someone submits. Um, oh, boy. Can we say something like a, a, cam a campaign's personal, you know, website or whatever? I mean, we can't. I mean, it, that, that's the town limiting speech, which is why this policy attempted to stay away from anything about content and just here's how many words, and you can submit a URL. I mean, we could refuse to put a URL in there, but um, I, I, speaking as a charter commissioner, one of the goals was to allow a link um, so that people, candidates could, in one place, every candidate could send people to something, their campaign page, and it could be found easily on the town website. That's speaking as a charter commissioner, but but if this council doesn't like the idea of a hyperlink, we can take that back at GOL this week and discuss whether we'd remove that allowance. Alyssa. Following up on that, um, again, the free speech issue is the issue you can't possibly say we'll be allowed to have editing privileges, is that because we're not calling it government speech. If it was government speech, then it wouldn't be allowed under Office of Campaign and Political Finance laws. I mean, that's how we're able to make this separation. And so, I wonder, maybe GOL could talk about, what if we put in the link, but it wasn't a hyperlink? So then you don't have to worry about the interstitial page that we may or I don't remember if we use anymore or not, because you can't get there from here. You have to copy and paste it. Because literally, if you're on, if you're on the internet, you know how to copy and paste. And then you're taking it at your risk, and that would be part of the disclaimer. We don't know what this links to. 
that's your choice to link there. But that way, we wouldn't have anybody saying, wow, from the town website, I can get to pornography. I mean, right? right? I mean, right. you'd have to copy and paste it. It wouldn't be a live link. Mm -hmm. And therefore, no risk mm -hmm. of, you know, I was just clicking on the town website. Right. That's, that's my concern. OK. So they can provide information about a link, but it won't be live. OK. Yes, Steve. Just a question, shouldn't redevelopment authority be one of the, we have housing authority. Redevelopment authority is no they're longer not, elected. They're not elected. Okay. <laughs> yes. Andy. Yeah, I'm uh, somewhat confused always every time I read the definition of town bulletin board in the charter because um, it uses the word or, so that it gives three different things that can be the town bulletin board, but the connecting word is or, not and. Um, as a consequence, if we really mean one thing, which is the website, uh, then we should just uh, say it and not bother to go into great detail about quoting the um, charter because I think that the charter definition confuses and doesn't clarify. Um, and I'm also concerned that we don't really want to put it on the paper bulletin board that's uh, outside the clerk's office or wherever because the amount of paper that would have to be up there. So is this a matter of saying for the purposes of this um, policy that town bulletin board shall be defined as? Yes, I think that uh, under the charter that that's um, a permissible thing for us to do in this policy. And if that's what we mean, then we should just say it. OK. Other comments, questions? Okay, then uh, we'll be back to vote on this on the 23rd. I'm sorry. Yes, So, so GOL is going to be meeting again before that, taking an official vote on this, and I guess leaving. This is one of those discussions where I was hoping to get a lot of input and, and really didn't. And so um, with the exception, it sounds like maybe there's some sense of this idea of unhyperlinking the hyperlink, but I heard it from a couple people, and I don't know if that's a consensus of the council that GOL should actually change. And other than that, I'm not hearing any other changes. Is that correct? I want to know what GOL is doing with this at our next you meeting, know, other think, than I voting. I think that's it the like only suggestion that was made. Any other? Oh, no, there was one other. Yeah. Um, it was to do with uh, when you hand the, um, yeah. the yes. paper, the, yes. the URL, to the candidate, yeah. that they should get it when they take out their petitions, yeah. as Alyssa said. Right. Right. OK. All right. Anything else? All right, then we're going to go to the Town Council Rules of Procedure clarification of the clerk reference, Mandy Joe. So we haven't changed anything from two weeks ago. This is our second reading on this as required by the rules. Um, all of the changes are up there um, in shorthand. Um, it is to add the phrase, quote, of the council after the word clerk in rules 5.1.d.1, 5.1.d.5, 6.2.f, and 10.6.j.3, add the word town before the word clerk in rule 8.2d, and reformat the phrase with the assistance of the clerk of the council and town manager to delete the underlining and change the color and delete the extra space, to delete the final s in the word sessions in the first sentence of rule 5.3, and increase the font size to 12 for all of rule 8.2c. Those are the three sets of Scrivener type changes, clerical changes. The first two are the um, ones that clarify what clerk we're referring to when we refer to the word clerk. 
And as I said, no changes from the last time we read this. Any questions? Okay, so rather than repeat all of the different lines there, let me just read. The motion is to revise the town council rules of procedure as shown on the document titled Rules of Procedure Revised 2019-08-19, proposed GOL revisions, clerk clarification, and described as follows. And all of the things that are in light text up there are one through five. That is the motion. Do I hear a motion? George, a yes, second. Ma Pat, any further discussion? Then all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? And so it's 12 in favor, none against, no abstentions, and one absent. Okay. Intermunicipal agreements. I'm going to ask mm -hmm. Mr. Bachman to speak to this. So annually, there are a number of intermunicipal agreements that the town council will be asked to approve. The town enters into inter intermunicipal agreements when there's uh, opportunities to uh, work with other communities to provide a service that doesn't make sense for one community to provide. So the three that are before you tonight are the sealer of weights and measures, and that's where we use the uh, city of Northampton sealer for, for our, to serve our sealer because we don't have enough scales or things for that person to, to test. And we pay $12,367 for that service. Uh, the municipal hearing officer is um, a person who will hear uh, cases, uh, appeals of decisions uh, by uh, and or a uh, bylaw of the town doesn't get used hardly ever, but we utilize the city of Northampton's hearing officer so we don't have to provide for one. And that's a cost of $812.50 to the town. And then we are part of a very large uh, consortium of veteran services um, that hosted at the city of Northampton. And that caught it with the number of one, two, three, four, five, six, about 10 towns, uh, the communities that participate and that costs the town $100,603. And so those are the three that I'm presenting to you um, tonight. Others will come through as, we, as they get developed. Um, we, for instance, we share kennel services uh, with the city of Northampton. Uh, we, will, we share services, um, uh, some water services with the town of South, with the South Deerfield Water District, things like that. But as they are developed and paperwork gets done, I'll be back to you for the request approval of those as well. So are there questions about the individual agreements? Yes, Shalini. I just had a general question about how do how is these prorated across the towns? Like if you're paying 100,000, what are the other towns paying and how is that decided? Sorry. So the other towns, um, so Northampton pays $117,418, and it's um, based... For which, for which agreement? Oh, this is for the veterans. Okay. So this is based on population, so that, that's how the, this formula works. So po population would include students, I suppose, or...? Yes, it, it, whatever our population is defined as uh, under the census, that's, that was what we work off of. So some students would, are included in that, of course. The census population, the town of Amherst in 2010 was 37,000 plus. Just to, for veterans, it's not counting vet, veterans, it's counting population. I'm sorry, Kathy, can you repeat that? It's just questioning on population counts. So when I look at veterans, uh, is it counting the veterans who live in each of these areas, or is it counting total population? Because when Paul said what Northampton is paying, uh, we have a larger population than Northampton, but you gave the Northampton numbers a bigger number, so I was thinking that it might be the veterans population. Hmm. 
I, d I don't think it's veterans because that would change. I think it is, uh, it is population and whether, I'm not sure exactly what number they pull from for that, but I can find that out for you. D does the um, veteran services include a multiple number of people? Yes, it's a, it's a decent, I'm not sure how many people are in the office, there are a number of people in the office, so. Okay. It's not so just the one person. Collectively, that whole budget across the 10 towns, I think you said, yep. is how much? Probably about 250, 300,000. And Northampton and us pay the Two vast majority. Of it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Are there other questions? So the motion is to authorize the town manager to enter into certain intermunicipal agreements under Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 4A, as outlined in the town manager memorandum to town council, um, in this case, dated today, September 6th, thank you, 2019. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Does this mean you'll come to us with a different memorandum each time you're, okay. So we will authorize these individually or collectively in a bunch, whatever. Al Alyssa. I just wanna clarify that there's, it's very specifically says authorized because of what Mass General Law says. We don't approve the content Right. We authorize him to sign them, and you know, obviously, we might not give him authorization if we don't like the content. But you see, you don't have the content, so um, that it's not approval; it's authorization. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, then all those in. There's motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? No. Okay. I uh, abstain? Um, yes. Just for the ones that come to us in the future so we can look at them quickly, it might be useful to do what Shalini asked, that if we said you're getting authorization for this amount, that's out of a total budget of, of whatever. So we just have some sense that we're a majority, a minority. A, oh. Right. Uh, the next action item on our agenda is uh, to discuss and refer, probably, uh, the town council policy on zoning bylaw hearings. And just a little context, as we came up to review the large group of zoning bylaws, uh, basically the zoning, the planning board had, am I correct, planning board held their own hearing and publicized it, and then we publicized and held our own, own hearing. And the question was raised as to whether or not we could just hold a joint hearing, and then each of us take the respective action. So that's the purpose of this agenda item and the purpose of this discussion. Are there questions? Alyssa. Fine. Um, we should do this. We should have done this. It should have happened the last time. I mean, but we should do this moving forward because it costs money and it takes time to advertise both hearings. And as you say, we can act separately. We don't have to decide the same night they decide, et cetera. So this would be something that would go into rules of procedure? GOL could make a decision whether to add it to the rules or just create a policy to adopt. Okay, okay. So the motion is to refer a potential town council policy on zoning bylaw hearings to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee with a report to the town council, I'm gonna say on October, whatever that date was. 17? October 20, 21. 21, 2019. Does that work? Is a motion? I'll, I'll move that. You move a second? Got it. Anything else? 
Okay, then all those in favor of that, please raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed, abstain, and one absent. So it was 12-4, no opposed, no abstain, one absent. Um, we have one memo from me, and it's on the appointments of the Percent for Art Ad Hoc Committee. This is a committee that we created at our last meeting, and the, as soon as I get my paper sorted out, I'll find it. The motion, the uh, charge that we, are the, statement that we passed last time required that there be two members from the Amherst Public Arts Commission and three members from the town council. Um, I did ask Bill Kazin and he suggested uh, himself and James Barnhill and then I solicited from counselors their personal interest. I received responses from about seven counselors. There were a couple people were interested, but more importantly, people were interested in making sure that um, the committee had people knowledgeable um, about finance, about architecture, and also um, some of the research that had been done. And so based on that, um, I have put before you uh, Kathy Shane, Steve Schreiber, and Andy Steinberg. I don't believe this requires a motion. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, there are no other committee appointments at this time? Right? Okay. So we're moving on to committee reports. Um, Pat, anything on audit? Uh, nothing new right now. We're gonna be meeting at the end of October. Okay, bylaw review. We've gone through animal welfare. We've put the, the uh, bylaws on, signed bylaws aside for the council to look at, and we're on schedule to bring a final draft, I believe, in November. I gave the date last time. I don't have it with me right now. And those require two readings, is that correct? Yes. So we need to make sure that if there are ones that we need to discuss in any significance because we only have one meeting scheduled in November at this time, and that's November and 18th. I'm not, yeah, I'll do a double check on the date. I said it last, at our last meeting, but okay. I will email it to you. Okay, so you know thank sure. you. And then, so probably based on the fact that the next meeting after that is December 2nd, uh, we're gonna probably wanna make sure that we actually introduce them as early as October. October 20, huh? No we way. Probably, we can't do that. Yeah. We're not going to be done. Okay. <laughs> so, so we then, have a timeline that we can get to you. Okay. The, the issue isn't, I, I understand your timeline. The issue is when do we have council meetings? And when we set the calendar, because November has both the election in it right. and Veterans Day, we don't have a meeting until November 18th. We worked it out. We'll, we will send it to the council in November. It doesn't need be acted on in November. I thought we had to act on it by December 3rd. We, no, no. because you didn't, we did not appoint that committee December 3rd. Right. We have a year from when that committee was Okay, appointed. thank you for that clarification. Yeah. I, I appreciate We're that. We're okay. I was trying to meet a, a year deadline yeah. that was fictitious in this case. Right, okay. and we, we, do have, we do have a set of dates and we can get an updated set to you. Okay. I, we will get that it, from C Jeff Kravitz. That would yeah. be great if we could just get a sense of when that's coming so we can look, look at agendas. Um, yes, Mandy Jo. I just wanna, the year is submit a report with recommendations, not act on it according to the charter. So as long as they submit within the year, they they've complied with the charter. We don't have to have them passed within that year. Right. So as long as they submit by December 3rd. No. no, no. By the appointment of the Following committee. Following its creation. 
Thank you. So whenever think, they were created, not appointed, whenever I, they were created, they got they, one year to submit a report with recommendations, I think and then we can act after that. I think they have those sometime in January. Okay, we'll check on that, but thank you, and it, getting the calendar of that would be useful. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, Community Resources Committee, Steve. So last meeting, continued review of master plan. Um, we had another meeting scheduled for this coming Wednesday morning, but that's canceled because of um, a posting glitch. So we meet again in two, um, 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 September 25th. Let me mention we do have a, an opening on the CRC committee in that Sarah has decided she's not able to serve on that committee at this time. Excuse me, so I will go back and I'm going to poll the entire council as to people's interest for CRC. Uh, there have been other people who have been continued to be interested and continued to attend. Um, okay. Could we have a deadline on when that happens so we can have somebody at our next meeting? Um, Okay, so if we do that, then I'd have to bring it forward on the 23rd. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Alyssa. I have a CRC question. Sure. I think given the extensive written reports provided by other council committees, CRC needs to step it up. <laughs> We're not getting any written reports from mm -hmm. CRC, and I think that you don't have to have made decisions on things, but to give us a sense of what we're going to be looking forward to is really useful. GOL's done that on numerous occasions. OCA does that all the time as well. And um, rules of procedure used to do it. And I really feel like we need that from CRC. And I recognize that CRC is like a whole bunch of things. But to just give us more than the sentence we get at our meetings would be really useful. So we can explain to people out in the public, too, as well as us understanding what's coming up. Can, can I just add to that the particularly where the two things have been referred to two committees? So housing policy is one that's sitting with both of us. It's just helpful to know when there's going to be a focus on it and how you're planning on focusing on it so that we don't duplicate. I mean, I would come to the meeting to hear the discussion. So just the heads up when it's an overlapping. Okay. The Council Goals Ad Hoc Committee has not met since, I mentioned this the last time, however, the draft goals will be a topic of discussion at our retreat on the 21st. Finance Committee, Andy? Yes, I wanted to just take a moment to add a little bit to the written report that uh, we sent to you, which uh, was really covering action items. but. Um, had a very brief discussion about that portion of the meeting that was the combined meeting with JCPC around the major capital planning questions. Um, and it was a very um, rich discussion. And um, if you, some of you were there, some of you may have seen it on Amherst Media. It is available on Amherst Media. And uh, so the you should know that it's available for you. Um, we talked about the financial planning tool, version 1.3, which was sent to the committee. You received a number of comments, and it is still under review based upon the comments received at the meeting. Um, so that's still a work in, project, in progress. Um, this is, of course, as you know about the uh, four projects, the, the four major projects, and we recognize that we can only build them if we scrutinize costs very carefully and we think about the spacing, and that's part of what the financial planning tool helps to visualize both for members of the committee, members of the council, but also members of the public and the goal still is to uh, find a way to make it available to the public. And we're working 
um, or I shouldn't say we, the um, staff is working with um, IT to develop a web page that will house the um, tool when it launches uh, to the public so that there's more material available about the projects and about how to use the tool effectively and explains the tool a little, um, little bit. So that's still being worked on. Um, I think that what we really came down to, however, is that these are going to be very difficult decisions and they're going to be difficult for the, all of us who are sitting in this room because in the end, this is about us making the decisions and uh, that uh, what we choose to bond, uh, what we choose, the amount we choose to bond, when we choose to bond, and when we choose to go out to debt exclusion overrides are really difficult questions that will be before us. And as we do that, and I'm, um, Alyssa and I were on the select board when we did the last override vote for a debt exclusion override, and it was not an easy decision. As I said to the uh, joint meeting, it takes a lot of thought about what you're asking voters to do, what feels justifiable in the amount that you're going to ask them to tax themselves for a project, and um, also the choice of which projects and why you want to go out there and do that. In order to facilitate that, our suggestion as we were, uh, as the question evolved was that we really need to find ways that all of us can hear from our constituents and that um, both uh, district meetings and trying to um, have district meetings that are organized on some common basis as well as a forum are two mechanisms that were discussed. I don't think that they're necessarily exclusive, um, but um, at a later date we will want to talk with you about uh, whether that's something that you think is valuable and what kind of assistance would, should be provided either by the committees that have been working on this or the staff to have effective district meetings that will help you to understand what your constituents want and um, to make sure that it's an informed process. And, uh, I think that that probably covers the major points that were there, um, but um, you know the other thing that we un we recognized is that part of the process needs to be um, helping um, those constituents understand what each of the four projects will offer to the community if we go forward, we as a community go forward with them, and what the consequences are of inaction and not building the projects, and uh, that that needs to be a part of it. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know if anybody else who is um, on either of the committees or on the finance committee wishes to add to it, but um, I think that summarizes the discussion. Dorothy? Um, I, I have a question about um, our district meetings. Um, as to what personnel might be available for us. Um, and I know that we're not to make our own contacts. We have to do it through Paul. So the question is, there's a lot of districts and we need a plan maybe. I mean, we have, we have a date for District 3 of October 20th. And George and I, have, we've discussed a variety of things we could make as our focus. But um, Lynn has suggested informally that maybe that we need to spend that time on, on the capital projects. So is it going to be George and me doing it? We, we decided that neither of us feels comfortable demonstrating the, the tool. Right. Um, and so it's kind of like, I don't think we want to just all go grabbing Paul's attention saying, can I have this one, can I have that one? Yeah. So maybe a plan from you would be helpful. Um, this is something Paul and I have discussed somewhat but we'll now take up even more. It was clear from the conversation with finance and JCPC that we do need to do these kinds of outreach and we need to have some consistency about how those meetings, or at least that portion of the meeting, happens. So very much like the schools did, they had a standard format. They had six meetings spread throughout the town and they had, um, you know, 
standard introduction, a way in which people were asked to look at different questions and issues, and a way to give feedback and summarize. And I think we have to do the same thing for all of our counselors. I personally am committed to being at each of the meetings as long as they're not on the same night at the same time. Can't do that, haven't figured it out yet. Uh, but, uh, I, and there are other people um, who are on the finance committee and so forth that are probably maybe a little more comfortable with the model. So it shouldn't fall totally to the town staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yes, we owe you a plan, mm -hmm. including dates, yes. Alyssa? As part of that plan, um, one thing I think would be helpful, even though one might argue that since we stalled out planning the capital plans in 15 and 16, maybe it wasn't entirely helpful, um, is that, uh, and I found it a little disturbing that the newspapers are reporting that we have no idea how much things are going to cost. Actually, we have a pretty darn good idea of how much things are going to cost and how we're going to roll things off, even though we have to get more specifics, and of course all the costs have gone up. But in addition to that, having a handout prior to those meetings about each of the projects, and I mean one side of a piece of paper. Finance Committee did do this several years ago after Mr. Steinberg was on the select board already, but, um, and we had to be careful because it was clearly biased in its first draft. But beyond that, just to explain like, that very, a brief version of here's what happens when, because we didn't act, here's where we are now, here are our choices, and whether you know it's one page about each project and then something that's a summary that goes with that. But to be able to continually send those out to our constituents and to be able to refer to them, I find incredibly useful as opposed to just assuming that, well, if people are interested, we can get them to come to some particular district meeting at some particular moment. So I would really appreciate it if Finance Committee felt like, I know they have a lot on their plate, but they could work on something like that that would describe I, the project. I actually don't feel that this is completely just the responsibility of the Finance Committee, but it starts, kind of starts there, so thank you. Uh, other comments about this while we're on the topic? Yes, yeah, Shalini. Mm, Sean is not here today, but I just want to acknowledge the work he did, and he really simplified the tool to the extent that I feel really comfortable using it, and I wish I'd said that to him last time. So please let him know that. We really appreciate his work. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Pat. Yeah, and while I appreciate the tool, it's not going to be as effective for everybody in town. And I think that we need to um, be moving into um, parts of our district that we don't ordinarily go in so that we're actually getting feedback from people who don't come to district meetings, who don't, won't use the tool for whatever reason, no judgment. Um, and, and ultimately, how are we going to really listen? Because if the town is saying something that we don't like, then we have to move, they don't. And I think we, how do we really listen? Mm -hmm. Not just hear what we want to hear. Okay. Mm. Any other comments? Yeah. Yes, okay. Shalini. I think it would be really helpful to have a set of questions that the kind of information we want to draw out from the residents in the sense where it, you know, and, and also there's certain things that are going to impact them, like just the tax, I mean, the property taxes, okay, they may not be able to decipher, but we can say, hey, this is the impact it's going to have on this. So, you know, solicit specific questions rather than just to go, anyone talk about anything like, oh, I don't want library, I want this, I, don't, I mean. So what, frequently asked questions. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and things that, I don't, I don't know how to say this, but. I feel that there are times that we're asking people questions, but then we're going to do what we want to do. And there is that dissatisfaction then in people that, hey, we spent all that time, we shared our ideas, and then nothing happens with it. So I mean, having some sort of clarity that what are the kind, what is the kind of information we're looking for in terms of how is this, how are these projects affecting people's quality of lives and where is it impacting them and getting that and then using that information to for us to make the decision so i don't so having a good set of questions to solicit um 
feedback would be good. Okay. All right. Additional questions or suggestions on that? Andy, we have a lot to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, GOL? We continue to bring you stuff. Hopefully we will bring you um, some changes related to resolutions, proclamations, commemorations, and citations soon. We're discussing a policy around them, um, and I think some of those policies will have to come to the council. Um, flag raisings, flag flyings, we're still working on that, and we're going to be discussing <coughs> revisions to the work groups and ad hoc committees coming up based on comments we received last time. Oka? Evan? So the content of my report pertains exclusively to what's also listed as agenda item 12C1, the bid block party. So um, may I ask your permission to move that agenda item up to pair with our report? Sure. Thank you. Uh, so this morning, uh, the Oka subcommittee on outreach met for the first time um, in kind of a while. You all remember our name is Outreach Communications and Appointments, and it seems like we're always just talking about appointments. Um, and so we've refocused a little bit on outreach. And one of the first places we saw that an opportunity for, for us to weigh in in an outreach capacity uh, is the upcoming bid block party. And so we do have uh, space reserved for the block party. Uh, many of us were there last year as town council candidates. Um, and there's an expect expectation that we'll be there again now as town councilors. Um, the question that we grappled with is, well, why, right? What is our role there? What are our objectives? And um, we threw out a couple options um, along the lines of sort of we're there just to show some face so that people see us, start to recognize us, see us in the community. Um, but also it's an opportunity, one, to engage people um, in the deliberations that we're having as a council, two, to uh, perhaps recruit people uh, for boards and committees, um, and three, to educate people about what we're doing as a council. Uh, and so we were lucky to be joined by two of the CPOs at our meeting this morning so we could hear what they were doing so we wouldn't duplicate what they're doing um, and had a good discussion about what we're thinking about doing. Um, and so you may notice there is a colorful table set up in the back that uh, Alyssa was happy enough, uh, or was kind enough. <laughs> Maybe she wasn't happy, it was in the morning. but. <laughs> But she was kind enough to, to put together a mock table. And so there's essentially um, five things that we came up with for the town council to do at the block party. Um, and so one, you'll notice uh, four jars, each labeled with a different capital project. And there was an idea of sort of having um, a, a voting ability. We would give people some number of pennies to be determined. Alyssa wants 10. <laughs> um, and ask them, you know, how would you prioritize the capital projects? And this is a way to sort of engage people in a big discussion that we're having in the fall in sort of a fun way of saying, well, which of these is most important to you? If, if these 10 pennies are your tax dollars, how do you want them spent? Um, another thing you'll see is the map of the districts. Uh, that's a map that the CPOs used last year. They uh, are not using it this year, and so we asked if we could borrow it. Um, so that people know, it's one thing to say you're a District 2 counselor, but if people don't know their district, that's not very useful to them. Um, there was some consideration of maybe having people put stars where they live so they can kind of identify that. Um, the CPOs also have a, a big board that shows all of our committees that we have as a town um, and uh, said that they could highlight in some way the ones that we're actively recruiting for. So we would also, we could also have that. So we could say, if you want to be involved, here's everything we do, and here's the ones that we're really looking for. Um, there was some comment about having a handout of some accomplishments um, or, or something so that we could say, hey, look, here's what we've done so far, if people want it. Um, there's another idea of having um, sticky notes. So that would say, you know, what are your priorities for the town or what would, you, what would you like to see happen in town or what would you like to see us do? And they could write on a sticky note and put on a post-it board and it could be a visual of, of the community's priorities. Um, and then there was also a discussion about something to hand out to kids um, with the idea being that if we can attract kids to the table, then we can talk to their parents, um, which are really our audience here. Um, and so there was an idea of candy or stickers. Um, there's an idea of perhaps if we could get 
fire truck stickers and uh, library sticker. We could have the stickers sort of mirror the capital projects. Uh, Alyssa searched for those. She's been unsuccessful in the one store she looked at, but we're confident that we could find those. <laughs> Somebody could find them. Um, and so these are, sort of, these are the six things that, that we came up with. And so um, the subcommittee is willing to sort of take some of the charge on this since it is an outreach opportunity, um, but we wanted to present to you those ideas um, and then hear back from you whether you love them, hate them, have other ideas, have suggestions, um, you know, reasonable suggestions um, that, we can, that we can work on. And of course, you can look at a, a, what it might look like um, of course, there'll be more. So, thoughts, comments, questions. The floor is open for suggestions, thoughts, and comments. Yes, Dorothy. Well, I, I really like what you've come up with. Um, I think that if we're going to ask people to do preferences, that we do have to have an early version of our, our fact sheet of the projects. Yeah. Um, it would be nice if there were pictures. Um, mm -hmm. when, when the fire EMS, I read fire is a verb when I came in. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't sure about that, <laughs> but I think, and I think we should give out lollipops. I think lollipops are good. Uh, Shalini, I saw your hand up earlier. Yeah, I think following, uh, using this as an opportunity to educate people about like DPW, they may not think DPW is important, but right. letting them know how important and how, how, much, how hard these people work and they deserve to have. Yeah, so use that as an opportunity. And in addition to what are people's priorities, maybe have an appreciation board. What, what are you loving about the new town council? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> we could have a big board up there and hope it doesn't stay blank. <laughs> um, okay. There you go. Or set a few kids up. Um, Andy. Yeah, just a little bit concerned about uh, putting pennies in the jar or whatever about the four major projects because I don't think that we have time to really make that an educated piece. And once you put the uh, request out there, if you get a whole lot of things in one or get very few things in another, it could um, be information as to what was the result of that that gets out of hand and I think would could create more havoc and more problems than we would want. So I would uh, be very cautious about doing that. Okay. Additional thoughts? Yeah, George. In the response to that, I, I hear that, but I, I think part of the, the real point was just to, for education. It's just to get people talking about these projects, give us a chance to uh, answer questions, um, and also make it clear to them that that choice they're making is uh, even how you know trivial it seems is the choice we're going to have to make, um, and so uh, I agree. We're not, I don't. No one's going to look at these jars at the end of the night and go, "Oh my God, <laughs> this is what we have to do." Um, so th I think that was the thought behind that. I also hope that everyone. I, I was thinking we'd have some kind of just a, a badge or something that says town council, so everyone knows or town councilor. Um, uh, Darcy had a suggestion. She you know had something she put on her back. But uh, not a target, but but her name <laughs> and town council during the campaign. But I just think hopefully everyone will be there at least for part of the time. Um, and if you are there, it's important that people know that you're a counselor. So in some way that we could, you know, just a you know simple thing we could make. If, if it, would people wear them? Um, I assume you would all. But uh, that was also something. So if you're walking around as I will be doing, we're not going to all be standing at a table. Um, people will see that, and maybe they'll just come up to you and ask you a question, and you can. So that was also a thought. Okay. Going to work on that one? That Not was actually target. discussed in, to, this morning. George is on OCA in the subcommittee. I just ah, forgot that's that right. piece. Right. No, that's but, right. and just want to make sure that people are willing to do that. If, right. if 10 of you say, no way am I going to go around with a big badge on right. me or something saying town councilor, then we won't bother with it. But the thought right. was it would be nice that if you are there, that people can easily identify you, um, that you are on the council. Shalini? I still think the jars is a good idea just to get people interested and excited, just as a play. It, you know, we can even say it. It's, you know, frame it whatever way, but I think it's fun and getting people, a good way to get people thinking about it. Okay. Um, I, I, I just want to add, while we have handouts for both DPW and FIRE, we would absolutely, 
absolutely have to go to the schools for the one about the schools and to the library for the one about the library. And whether or not they could put together a one pager in this time, I just don't know. That's my only concern on that one. Yeah. I think that um, Austin has one. Remember the flyer? But did you have your individual meeting with him? Yes, but I don't know that that constitutes a fact sheet or a basis upon okay. to do well, it. I'd have to go look at it. I thought it was. Again. I thought it was interesting, and it could it could kind of yeah. serve. But the school, yeah, Andy. Yeah, I think that we need to be very careful about this because there's a need for consistency amongst right. the statements as far as what they have and uh, the. Um, if we give this over without um, us as a council or a committee of the council doing some sort of editorial um, role in it, um, advocates of a policy are going to put down all of the positives and none of the uh, concerns. And uh, so there's the questions of consistency and the other. I, I would think that if you're going to do it, it's going to be really done without the benefit of doing anything that's going to be consistent education about each of the projects, and that was my concern. Um, I understand George's point that it could be a fun thing to do it, and, and you know, I did think about that aspect of it also. I just don't want them to think that the pennies in the jar are going to pay for the projects. Um, we did discuss that. That was one thought. <laughs> So maybe they put twenty dollars in the jars, and then. Okay. There we go. Just don't do anything like the Fall River Mayor. Um, yes. Well, is there any interest in us getting um, T-shirts uh, with Town Council on the front and our names in the back, or vice versa? <laughs> oh, <that's> great. <laughs> Um, okay, I just want to point out this, this event is on the 17th, and today is the 9th, so it's, um, you have eight days to get ready, okay? So, yeah. Yes, so uh, a couple follow-up questions. So first of all, um, we weren't sure, are y'all going to be there? I'm planning. Yes. Yes. Okay, we will have at least, and we know that some people have maybe a business that they have to go attend to as well, and some people have other committees who will also have a presence that they have to go back and forth. We want to make sure that there's at least some people at the table at all times. Mm -hmm. um, is there anyone who wants to take over one of these aspects and take charge of doing that and making it happen? Yeah, right, there you go. Um, I have district office hours. Can I cancel my district office hours for the BI? For oh, the yes. Party? Yes. Oh, right. Yes. Um, you raise a very good question. And I, one of the things I don't think we've resolved yet is whether or not, is how we talk about the four capital projects right. at this. I think there's hesitancy about rolling out something that's not completely thought through. And at the same time, you know, getting people thinking about it, yeah. It's just to get people thinking about it. it. I mean, I absolutely agree that we cannot let the library publish their own statement or the schools publish their own statement. Um, and I wouldn't want anybody to rush to try and get that done. This is purely for fun. And if it turns out that zero people put anything in DPW, then that tells us as a group that we need to educate people better about what's going on out there. And it'll just be, it'll just be silly. I mean, really, it's just a way of drawing them over other than candy. It is not like the newspaper's going to publish, well, that jar was twice as full as the other one. Guess you better not do that project. <laughs> really? So let's not take ourselves too seriously on this. But absolutely have those when it comes time for the forums. And if we even know, like, when one of those is, we could also we be mentioning We hope to publish that. a full list of dates. I don't know that we'll have them set by then. By then. But yeah. we could at least tell people to look to watch for them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we want to set up somebody demonstrating the model. That seems like a little tough to do. Um, any other ideas we'd like to shoot down? 
Um, I'm bringing my roll of pennies. So. Wow. We're, passing out. We're passing out pennies. This isn't like a business where everybody votes for their very, or schools have done. No, no. We right. are we'll crowdsourcing pennies. We need cash. pennies. From free cash. We are going, going to, to hand them out to people. And if you want to keep track of how many you gave us, then I will give them back to you at the end of the night. But no, this is not a people can bring their own money. This is here's your 10 pennies, figure out how to spend them. Do we okay. have to have a two thirds vote on uh, getting the pennies? <laughs> And I, I said, no, we are not packaging them specially for each person. We'll just. We have a collection of thousands of pennies at home. Yes. No, All just, right, there you I go. I just don't know whether I'm allowed to tap into them. Don't, just do it. Don't do it and then apologize. Just make sure you don't give away one that's worth something. Those were all, those were all separated, Lynn. We had those separated into their own category. All right. Okay, Kathy's in charge of collecting pennies. Um, all right, anything else to ask Oka to do at this point with regard to this responding to our outreach, which is terrific, thank you. We appreciate that. Yes, Darcy. So um, Oka is, does have another outreach project that we've been working on, mm -hmm. trying to put together a survey of what we're all doing in our district meeting outreach, which we've been trying to get full participation on for quite a few months now. And the two counselors that are still haven't responded shall remain unnamed. Um, but um, we already have, um, you know, we have the responses on a Google form that has a spreadsheet so that um, we can share it with all of you, and it will be informative, give you some ideas about what other people are doing, um, and we hope to do that very soon. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Then uh, we're done with committee appointments. Approval of minutes. Uh, you have before you the August 26, 2019 minutes. Um, the motion is to approve the 2000, the August 26, 2019 Town Council meeting minutes as presented. Um, they have already gone out for one set of reviews. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion, changes, questions, corrections? Okay, then all those in favor of approving the August 26, 2019 minutes, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. All right, Mr. Bachelman. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank you for the extension of my contract. I really appreciate it. It's really, um, I feel it, it makes, is, I feel it, it is a vote of confidence in uh, where we're headed as a, as a group. Um, it's an exciting, historic time to be part of the town, and I'm really honored to hold this position. And thank you, and the people of Amherst as well. Um, only a few things I want to mention, uh, a fairly lengthy report for you to have read. I'm sure you've read it. The Cup of Joe is this Friday at the Amherst Coffee with our Director of uh, Human Services, uh, Human Resources, uh, Evelyn Rivera Riffenberg. Um, we talked about the bulletin board and we're being more explicit about what the bulletin board means on our website. So if you go to amherstma.gov slash bulletin, you'll see the bulletin board and we'll make that where everything lives what that the charter requires us to put on the bulletin board. You'll also be able to, people will also be able to sign up to receive notifications if something gets published there and things like that. So um, they can subscribe to it. And so I think that that will help clarify to people what it means when it says it's been posted on the town's bulletin board. Uh, I mentioned a number of things that the Mass Municipal Association is, is doing. They have a legislative breakfast coming up. And then we will again coordinate the registrations for the annual meeting, which is in January, 
for the registration part, you will have to take care of your meals and your um, uh, accommodations, which we you get reimbursed for. Um, the I mentioned that the Amherst Pelham Regional School District School Planning Committee has completed their work and they've submitted their report, and uh, that will be added to our packet if it hasn't already. Um, the parking had a their final forum uh, last two weeks ago, maybe. They will be before you on September 23rd with the consultants making their final recommendation. There is a draft of the report online. They are working uh, hard to get the final report. We know that you're gonna need it in advance of the 23rd, uh, so you have time to read it. You will not be expected to make any decisions on the 23rd, uh, but it, I'm sure it'll be a robust discussion. Um, uh, uh, let's see. The strategic partnership agreement with UMass. So I've been, we've been working on this uh, for several months now. We have a agreement with UMass that calls for certain things. And that, that agreement ended on June 30th, although we're all, we're all abiding by it. Uh, the school superintendent has been involved with the, with the school portion of the negotiations, but Jeff Kravitz and Dave Zomack have really taken the lead on the negotiations. Uh, we are, I just want to outline for you where the sort of big areas that we're focused on. Um, we have four big areas. One is town services, what the town is doing that we believe the university is benefiting from, and that includes schools, public works, public safety, those types of things. So we have a lot of conversations happening around what does that, what, what that includes. Uh, we have another section we've been talking about in terms of improving communication between the university and the town, both ways, so that we are more in sync with their planning and they're in sync with our planning. So we ha have a better grip on where both sides are going. We have, we have very good communication with the university now, but we think we can improve it. Uh, a third area is in economic development. We want to be able to, to um, utilize the uh, great um, engine that the university has to leverage some additional development within town. Um, either, but all, and also to focus on our downtown area as well, that this, the university will see things that, that might benefit the town uh, based on the work that they're doing. And then we have a number of things that we're talking, we call one-timers, uh, one-time benefits, whatever, things that we think um, we'd like to talk, we're in the process of talking to them about things that they could do to um, benefit the town. Um, so that's where we are in the P, in the, I'm uh, sorry, the strategic partnership agreement with the university. Um, so I will continue to update the, the you on this as we move forward. Um, second item I want to bring about the university was if you saw the notice about their announcement that they, their board of trustees have approved, approved a public-private partnership P3 uh, development that would include rehabilitating the housing in North Village and building about 900 bedroom dorms on Massachusetts Avenue uh, up you know where their parking lots are right now. Um, this type of development is, is very large. It's adjacent to a, a major residential community of our town and our expectation is that they will in, in, uh, be involved in a robust community engagement process as they start to talk about this. Um, they have, I think the, the president has invited representatives from the university to come meet with you and, and not the next meeting, but the meeting after that to update you more formally on what, what they have in mind. And I know that some of them have been reaching out to some of you to talk more one-on-one -on, -one on this. And thirdly, um, just congratulations to the university as they have now been rated one of the top 24, the 24th in the country as a university. So they, that has been one of their goals and the chancellor has really been pushing for that and they, they deserve a lot of credit for the um, consistency, consistency they brought to it and the um, push for excellence that they have really brought to the university. So um, good things for them. So that's my report. Okay, questions? Yes, Evan. Paul. Yes. Participatory budgeting. Yes. We appointed them June 3rd. Yes. They have not met yet. They, they, I'll have make sure they meet. They, uh, it's, it's on Sonia's plate to do that, so we'll get you. it done. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Additional questions, comments? Alyssa? Food for thought for future town council meeting, as opposed to deciding anything tonight, because look how early it is, um, is this came up previously when I was on the select board as well. Sometimes when we put in electric chargers, we, the town comes to the elected body and says, we're going to put electric chargers in for cars because in that case you can't park in them unless you have a car that uses an electric charger, which means when we did that behind town hall, for example, it removed two spaces from anyone with a car to people with electric cars. Um, there was also some discussion as to whether or not people were paying for electricity, paying for parking, blah, blah, different conversation. But... In the town manager's report, it talks about having additional car charging stations that are going to take additional spaces out of circulation from the general population. And I feel like since we get to, we have to have hearings on how much parking is per hour and what the hours of enforcement are, et cetera, that it also should fall to us associated with taking parking spaces out of circulation, just like if we recommended that for the North Common that we decided we only wanted eight spaces instead of the ones that exist there now. So there seems to be a gray area associated with that. They are not in the public way, in the way that some would be, but there was discussion with the select board when we put the charging stations in both in the banks, in, both in the garage and behind town hall. So I'm a little uneasy about the fact that we just put in new charging stations, thus removing parking spaces without it being part of our whole parking discussion, even though of course we want more spaces. So it may be an issue that we need to decide what our policy is and when, when we have to look at this and when we don't. Um, and that would be a GOL discussion. Aren't we happy? Okay. Anything else at this time on the town manager's report? Okay. Yes. Um, have you decided on the tree, the catalpa? So I'm reviewing the information that the planning board and the um, tree warden have put together. I have not issued a determination on that, but I will this week. But I generally observe what the what our professionals advise in this situation. Okay. Anything else? Um, okay. Uh, town council comments. Um, I did automatically refer the celebration of Puerto Rican Heritage Month to GOL. Uh, I also would just want to call attention to your um, packet, which includes a letter from Senate President Emerita Harriet Chandler recognizing and thanking us for our, uh, our uh, proclamation regarding safe legal abortion. Um, the I am working on the, um, well, I will now begin working on the agenda for the retreat. Uh, several of you have given me suggestions. Unless we plan to be there for three days, we can't address it all. So we have to make some tough decisions and then look at when we might also do some follow-on retreat work as well. Um, and the last item that I've listed here, approval of ethics disclosure, I'm actually going to take up under the item 13, which is the um, not reasonably anticipated, um, and so I, I'll wait, wait until then. Uh, uh, future agenda items. I yes. just wonder, again, if we could get to a point of having a list, like Yes, like a we have the list. You have a list. We, we need know to you clean up <laughs> the list is what we need to do, and it's... That's one of my goals for our retreat, is to have that list. Um, anything else? Yes, George. Just quickly um, call attention to all of you to the article, three-part article that's appearing in the Gazette on the Northampton downtown. Um, if you haven't seen it, I think you should read it. Um, there's going to be three pieces. I think the second one was out today. Uh, it's front page uh, on the front page of the Gazette. Um, it just makes for interesting reading. Um, we often compare ourselves to Northampton. We think of Northampton in a number of ways. Um, and when we think about our downtown, uh, I think you might find this article uh, sobering and certainly worth your time. It's not that long, but it's going to be three pieces. The second one's already out. Thank you. Any other comments at this point? 
Um, we've under council comments. Yes, Darcy. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the ECAC is, you know, on the verge of going out into the community to get stakeholder out, uh, comments on uh, potential goals, climate goals and targets. So you may be hearing from people about that because we'll be probably talking to 30 or 40 different people doing our initial outreach. So that's just something that's going to be happening probably during this month. Okay. Anything else? Paul, I did raise a question. I want to just want to go back. The uh, chamber event, uh, mm -hmm. I guess in the past the town paid. We reserve a table or something. Yes. We reserved a table. Sure. Okay. And then if we exceed the number of people at that table. We'll, we'll get a second table. <laughs> we'll get a second table. So yeah. you are, the town is planning to pay yeah. for people and their spouse or significant for, other? Not, not spouses. Just counselors. individual counselors. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the date of that event is? October 3rd. October 3rd. Thank you. Alyssa. Can we just emphasize, October 3rd, you don't have to pay. You will have to let Angela will probably be the one yeah, who will yeah. send out a thing. You have to let her know if you're coming or not because department heads go to that too. If your spouse is coming, they can sit somewhere else and they can pay for their own ticket, just to be super clear. But this way it's accessible to counselors because we talk about whether or not being a counselor is accessible. $80 a ticket is not accessible to some counselors, so that's why the mm -hmm. town is covering this. Okay. Anything else on that? Um, so let me just mention, on this topic, it's not reasonably anticipated. Um, I had never realized that I would get one of these, which is a request from a person who is a teacher at the middle school, and they are now requesting approval to also teach for LSSE. Well, Mass General Law doesn't allow you to get two paychecks from the same employer, and that requires, therefore, a disclosure and a signature for the personnel contract that indicates our approval. Um, in my previous world, I saw many of these, so I had to, you know, often sign them for people to do, to teach a course for the university. Um, so rather than just go ahead and sign this and let you know I did, I figured I should bring it forward and either you authorize me to sign it and then the other question is, do we need a policy on this? Okay. So, at this point, I just want to make sure that Margarita Bonifaz can go ahead with teaching the class. So, the motion is to authorize the president to acknowledge the disclosure statement of Margaret Bonifaz and to sign the contract for personnel services allowing her to be paid by LSSE for teaching an acting slash improvisation course. Is there a second? Okay. Any further discussion? Yes. I don't think you have the option to sign this on your own. The way I read the MGL, the council I have votes. to sign it. No, no, I'm saying the council votes to let you sign. Okay. It wasn't an option for you to just decide to do it on your okay, own. Okay, thank Even you. Even though that would be much quicker. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. If I get these in the future, I'll come forward for a vote. Yes, Mandy Jo. Is that the correct motion, or is the motion that the council approves the exemption for Marguerite Bonifaz under MGL Chapter 268A, Section 20B? I'm sorry, which one? The second motion? All right. Margaret, strike the motion. Go ahead and make the other motion, please. <laughs> <laughs> Mandy Jo? I, I move... To, uh, do I have to say that the town council approve or just to approve? To approve, I move to approve the exemption, well, the exemption under MGL chapter 268A, section 20B for Margarita Bonifaz. 
Is there a second? George. I got another question. Sorry. Yes. Do, do we, I mean, the signature says on behalf of the council, once we approve it, that's kind of automatic. That doesn't need we to be in the motion. Add, we can always tack on the motion. Or should we tack it onto the motion? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any further questions? All those in favor of the motion, which has been made and seconded, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's 12 zero, 0 and one missing. Um, is there any other business at this time? Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? George, come on. All, right. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No, thank you. <laughs>